Uh, good, good morning and welcome to the 13th meeting of 2017 of the Environment, Climate Change, Land Reform Committee. We have apologies from Morris Golden. Uh, before we move to the first item on the agenda, I want to remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones and any other electronic devices as they may affect the broadcasting system. Um, agenda item one is can I welcome Peter Chapman to the committee as a formal substitute for our Deputy Convener, Morris Golden, and can I invite Peter Chapman to declare any interests he may have that are relevant to the work of the committee? Mr Chapman. Thank you, Convener. I'd just like to say that uh, I am a landowner and farmer in, in uh, Aberdeenshire, and we also have, uh, in relation to this particular uh, item today, we have four wind turbines that we own on the farm as well, so uh, that covers everything, I think. Okay. Thank you for that, Mr Chapman. Uh, agenda item two is decision on taking business in private. Uh, that relates to items three and four on the agenda. Are we all agreed? We are, we are indeed agreed. Okay, so we move to the second item on the committee's agenda this morning, which is to take evidence on the subject of air quality in Scotland. The committee uh, has agreed to hold an evidence session with experts and stakeholders to consider the scale of the issue of air quality in Scotland and the robustness of Scottish plans to tackle this. The evidence session will be structured in two panels, the first focusing on the environmental and health impacts of air pollution, the second on the effectiveness of the policies and management strategies to tackle these. Based on these discussions, the committee will consider whether it wishes to pursue the issue further and, if so, uh, which particular threads of the topic will be prioritised in the remit of any future inquiry. We're delighted to have been joined by two panels of witnesses this morning. We'll be taking evidence in a roundtable format to allow a fuller discussion of the issues. Members will be posing questions to prompt exploratory discussion, and if you wish to contribute, please indicate this to me or the clerks. Importantly, and this is important, if you don't wish to respond, you don't have to respond to every question. Each session will last roughly an hour, uh, so I would ask uh, that both the questions and answers are as succinct as possible to allow us to cover as much ground as possible. Uh, the first panel, we are joined by Professor David Newby, Fintan Hurley, George Curley, Dr Colin Ramsey and Janice Milne. Um, we'll move directly to questions. Uh, if you just bear with me, because I think I'm asking question number one. Um, can I ask... Uh, the panel, what are the main sources of air pollution in Scotland and how robust is the modelling and evidence to confirm this? Who wishes to go first? Janice Milne. Thank you. Um, so main sources of air pollution, we can start with, with industry. So we look at combustion um, from power plants and other industrial sources there. So um, we have a number of um, combustion gases, NOx, SO2. Transport um, is increasingly um, a contrib contributor to, um, to air pollution, as we've, as we've seen. Again, um, NOx and particulate matter there. With respect to, to modelling, industrial activities, which CEPA regulates, so these tend to be the more complex sites, we require operators to actually monitor what is emitted from their stack. SIPO will do some audit monitoring of that. We also ask operators to do some, some modelling, which will back up um, the emissions from the stack. We are working on the transport side of things under the Clean Air for Scotland strategy on actually modelling. And computer models, we know that... Um, there can be differences, number quite high percentage of variations between computer models. And that's one of the reasons that we're actually trying under the Clean Air for Scotland strategy to come up with one model that all local authorities can use, which would then reduce that uncertainty. So yes, with any computer model, there will be uncertainties and it's always advisable to then back that up with actual monitoring, but it's not possible to say an actual percentage with respect to um, how accurate the models are. Okay. Okay. So if, if one accepts that that's a very good answer to that first question, can I ask the other witnesses to consider 
um, of these main sources, how readily can they be controlled, and whether there are any new sources that are increasingly becoming a concern. For example, I read in the written evidence a suggestion that wood-burning stoves and commercial biomass boilers are causing concerns around CO2 emissions. So can we explore that angle? Colin Ramsey. My submission, actually, um, it's just a, very, a relatively recent phenomenon, I think, where there has been quite a, a marked growth in the use of wood burning stoves, etc. But uh, and I think that was particularly noted in London, in fact, in evidence that they looked at the kind of distribution of particulate pollution, especially, and were beginning to become concerned about the contribution of that. So, although we have smokeless control zones or smoke control zones, etc., from historical legislation, the Clean Air Act, I think that's that's a feature which people need to be aware of. So the picture is changing, um, it's evolving over time, and sometimes efforts to um, use more uh, sustainable sources of energy, for example, sometimes have unforeseen consequences when people don't necessarily predict them. And I think there has been a bit of concern in, uh, there has to be, seems to be an emphasis on switching from, and I know some people regard it as controversial, from uh, things like gas boilers in schools to biomass boilers. And again, uh, if you look at the emissions perspective in, in some of these, then whether or not they're actually advantageous is perhaps a little bit more questionable. So I think there are some trends. I wouldn't like want to exaggerate them um, in the relative terms to all the other contributions from transport, etc. But I think we just have to be aware that there are it's a changing dynamic in terms of uh, the, the sources of pollutants and how they are affecting the overall balance. So is it something we think we ought to be concerned about or we know we ought to be concerned about? I think we know we ought to be concerned about anything which is contributing more to air pollution. Yeah. We ought to be so concerned about. So what I'm getting at is yeah. there is some evidence there that suggests that this is an actually an issue that we should be. Con yes, certainly from London. Uh, the latest work in London has looked at uh, the contribution of um, uh, uh, wood burning stoves, etc., to particulate pollution. Okay. And what about the, the ability to control the main sources that we are absolutely sure of? How are we placed with that? For those activities that are specified in regulations, then CEPA has a uh, responsibility to authorise, so an operator has got to apply for a, for a permit, and as part of that, the operator has got to demonstrate that they're using what we call the best available techniques to reduce or minimise emissions. And not only um, do we have a role in protecting and improving the environment, but also health and wellbeing and um, sustainable economic growth. So as far as those activities that are regulated, we have an authorisation and the operator has got to um, comply with that. It's less easy with what we describe as non-regulated sources, such as diffuse pollution, whether that comes from, from transport or other um, domestic, domestic premises. Okay, thanks very much. Let's move on. Uh, Kate Forbes. Um, our written evidence from SEPA uh, stated that all pollutants, with the exception of ammonia, had shown dramatic reductions over time. So why has ammonia not reduced at the same rate as other relevant pollutants, and what action might be taken to address this? Okay, thank you. The main um, sources of ammonia emissions result from agricultural activities. And therefore, they're less easy to control because they are termed what we call diffuse pollution. So other than intensive agricultural installations, so that includes intensive pig and poultry, which we regulate, and we can set certain conditions on it. As I say, it's more difficult to set controls. Um, you're speaking about, um, as I say, manure, spreading manure, etc., etc. So that's why we've not seen emissions of, of ammonia reduce as in respect of other industrial activities, which are perhaps less easy to control with certain abatement techniques. But it is something, I think, that, that requires um, an, in, an increased focus, but it, it does require the, the policy um, emphasis as, as well to be placed on, on that. It's maybe just a guess, but the primary pollutants that we get focused on are particulates nitrogen dioxide, ozone, and so on. Ammonia has an effect by combining with those gases to make other particles. So I'm thinking that it isn't directly in the line of sight as much as other pollutants, because its role is uh, sort of secondary and indirect, but still important. Anyone else? Kate. 
our other written evidence uh, made the point that the levels of air quality are constantly changing. What difficulties does, does this pose to monitoring and mitigation? And how do you think moving forward can we improve upon that um, and make sure that we're constantly improving the quality of air? Well, well, perhaps if, if I can start. We, we do have a number of um, 95 monitoring networks around, around Scotland. They, um, regularly, information is, is produced on an automatic basis, um, available on the web. Weather conditions obviously um, do impact. Um, we see clear still days where pollution doesn't move so far. So you'll see in a cold day that what we call an inversion layer, where pollution gets trapped levels will be higher then than if it's a windy day. So that's why we're why you will see variations in what is picked up um, on at monitoring at monitoring stations. The weather weather does play quite a, a, a big role um, mm. on that. Philly Carson. Just just a, a, a very quick question. Have we baselined uh, these uh, pollutants? You know we talked about agriculture playing playing a major role um, do we actually know whether the amount of ammonia produced through agriculture is, is increased or decreased? Uh, we're now seeing anaerobic digesters and different um, methods of cropping and whatever. So are we looking at an increase or a decrease in the pollutants uh, caused by agriculture? I don't have that information um, to hand. I can, I can um, provide that later on. The one thing I think we need to be aware of is transboundary impacts as well. So air pollution isn't, doesn't sit neatly within one boundary. So we always have to take into account that we are seeing pollution effects from other European countries, for example. So it is quite difficult to get a baseline. But saying that, um, with respect to, to background levels, that's why we have some monitoring sites for example, at Strathveich up in the Highlands, because that's a, a rural site and it allows us to understand what background levels may be in a rural area and, and compare that with, with what's happening in, in other areas. Richard Lyle. I think on board the uh, agriculture, uh, does any panel have any concerns over waste to heat plants that are being currently uh, at planning stage? No, I think um, I'm not aware of anything. Each planning application would be dealt with on its, um, on its own merits. SEPA is a, a statutory consultee together with, with other um, organisations, so um, I'm, not, um, I'm not aware of, of anything, no. Okay. Kate. Last question about the, the general picture. What currently are the key targets, in your view, for air quality, and are they adequate? Well, the, the, um, the targets are set within the air quality strategy for the UK, um, Scotland, England, Ireland, and um, they are set as objectives. So they're set as objectives to protect human health. So that is what we um, are aiming for and um, consider that they are, they are the, the, the adequate targets, yes. Okay, uh, Finton Harley. Well, with, say, particulate air pollution, the, the strong understanding now is that there isn't such a thing as a safe level. So no matter how good the target is, there are likely to be health effects uh, to be found. So it's really important to remember that, particularly for particles. And I think it's the best working assumption for NO2 also. Uh, for ozone, it may not be the case. Now, I think in Scotland, Scotland has adopted for particles more ambitious targets than the UK or than the EU would require. And I'm really, really glad of that. Even if they're met, it doesn't mean the problem is entirely solved because the biggest problem with air pollution is that you can't avoid exposure. Everybody's exposed. So even if targets are met, there will still be health impacts. And I think there will still be even a substantial public health issue that sometimes the science lets us down. I, I think, for example, a few years ago, we were all encouraged to buy diesel vehicles because we were told they were better for the environment. And then the World Health Organization reveals that the, the testing of the filters on modern diesels was not properly conducted. And in fact, these are spitting out worse particulates into the atmosphere, cancer-causing particulates, than we'd ever believed was the situation in a, an urban setting. Um, thank you. I, I think there are two two aspects to that. 
The first is the huge importance of not developing policy in isolation. Mm -hmm. And you know, the Scottish policy is set up to not develop air quality policy in isolation, to look at climate change effects, to look at placemaking effects and so on. And I'm really, really glad of that. So the push towards diesels came in the first instance for climate change issues before people realised that the local air pollution problems that they caused were going to be so big. Mm. And, you know, the, well, the, the, well, let's just say the failure to do the emissions testing correctly isn't necessarily just a failure of science. I mm. think we all know that there's maybe more to it than that. Yeah, okay. Let's move on. Angus MacDonald. Uh, convener, good morning uh, to the panel. Uh, I'd like to explore uh, in some detail the air quality management areas. Um, now, we know from, from SEPA's submission that uh, despite improvements in recent decades, there, um, and I quote, are still some urban hotspot areas where air quality is of concern. And we know that there are currently 38 AQMAs in Scotland with all but two uh, declared for transport emissions. Now, I, I know from representing my Falkirk East constituency that uh, one of the other um, of the two AQMAs takes in the Grangemouth Petrochemical co Complex and the surrounding area, and it's been declared following sulphur dioxide breaches, uh, and it's been in place for some time, perhaps too long. Now, um, AQMAs do seem to help, the, uh, help to concentrate the minds of some of the firms. Ineos, uh, for example, in Grangemouth have invested significantly with uh, £30 million on a, on a sulphur recovery tail gas unit, which has resulted in significant reductions in SO2 breaches. Um, so that's one of the uh, non-transport emission AQMAs uh, accounted for. Um, I wonder if uh, perhaps SEPA could uh, tell the committee where the other one is um, and where the worst of the urban hotspots within the other 36 AQMAs are. Janice Milne. Okay, thank you. So the, the second that you refer to is a site in West Lothian, New House, if I'm correct. And the reason for the exceedances in that air quality management area is due to um, domestic use and also non-transport emissions. Sorry, could you clarify domestic use? So, sorry, um, so stoves. Um, there must be an awful Would, lot. Sorry? There must be an awful lot of stoves in West Lothian. Uh, well, that's the, um, the, the data that's, that's been gathered, but I can, okay. as I say, um, but that's the information um, that I can provide later on. But it, it is um, it's non-transport and it relates to, as I say, domestic, um, domestic use there. Well, it's with further oh, well, detail yes, on that, and that would be useful yes, to have that yes. information. Okay, and... Sorry, could you um, give us an indication of the worst of the other urban hotspots, the, the other 36 AQMAs? I don't have the, the, the worst um, hotspot other than knowing that um, we can identify the, the, the major areas. So I, I wouldn't today want to say what is the worst hotspot today. We know that areas such as it. Um, Hope Street in Glasgow, particularly areas in, in, in Edinburgh, but um, I can, I don't have, I'll submit that information um, after. So, Mark Roscoe. Thanks, Convener. I mean, just coming, coming back to AQMAs that are largely by, designated because of transport emissions, um, what actions do you actually take in these areas that are highly polluted? What, what actions is, is CEPA actually involved in? So, the, the responsibility is, is for the local authority to review and assess the air quality within their area against the objectives which are set in the air quality strategy. Where these levels do not meet the objectives, local authorities have got to um, submit an action plan which details the actions that they will take to meet those objectives. We review and assess those plans. So then, as I say, the local authority has got to put an action plan together. And this is one of the challenges with respect to how do you, how do you improve. So we see that it's, it's largely, as we've spoken about, the majority of the air quality management areas are, are down to transport emissions. So it's for the local authority to put plans in place. And that's one of the challenges, is actually knowing what action to take, which will give you the, the reduction in emissions. But it's not... 
Sorry? So if you're looking at a plan yes. and you judge that the actions within that are not going to be effective to reduce nitrous oxides and particulates, do you step in and tell the local authority that it needs to change the plan or, or what? Yes, we would do if we didn't think it was adequate. That's probably one of the reasons why we've got the Clean Air for Scotland, because we know that it is so difficult to, to, to address it. So while we would have the powers to step in and say it's not, um, it's not effective, we wouldn't do that in isolation and knowing all the facts. Because as I say, we've got the, we now got the strategy, the commitment for one, at least one low emission zone by, by 2018. But it is a very difficult um, problem to address, which requires a, a different... A, a and how often have you stepped in? <coughs> to say a plan isn't adequate, I don't have that information at the moment. I can come back to you um, on right. that. It doesn't, it doesn't stick out that you have actually intervened in any of these plans? I think we probably have, but I'm sorry, right. I don't have the information okay. to my hand. We have a, um, at least two people that deal um, specifically with local air quality on their local air quality management plans. So where they have been inadequate, we have gone back and said they're not adequate, but I don't have that, the numbers in front of me to say um, to you. Certainly we are tightening up um, with respect to getting local authorities to submit their action plans on time. Uh, they weren't always getting submitted timely to us. We were able to use Section 85 powers. We haven't had to use that because local authorities and the submission of plans have been um, far better with respect to performance at submitting these plans. Yes, the challenges, the effectiveness, and actually seeing the results through. I think it would be useful, convenient, to have a couple of case studies on that where CEPA has and where it hasn't intervened and, and the reasons. Absolutely. That, that's the evidence we really want to know. That would be is, is the regulatory system actually working here or not? Okay. Uh, Angus MacDonald. Yes, thanks. Yeah, just following on from Mark Rus Ruskell's point, could I ask uh, Janice Milne if, if she believes that liaison between local authorities and SEPA is working on, on, on specifically air quality? Yes, I would. Yes, we've got good links. We've worked with local authorities over many years. The local air quality management system has been in place um, since 1996, so we've got we work we work well with local authorities, and we're involved with um, there is a the Scottish Pollution um, Coordinating Committee, which is a forum at local authority level. CEPA is, is represented there, and also in other groups with with local authorities. And would you say local authorities have adequate powers to deal with uh, uh, air pollution and breaches of AQMA I think I think the challenge is actually. Um, they have the, the um, do they have the powers? The challenge is actually being able to implement action plans which require <coughs> changes in, in public behaviour. It's not a simple thing to, um, to, to enact, otherwise probably the local authorities would have made these improvements um, many years ago. It requires a concerted effort, which is why CAF's Clean Air for, for Scotland <coughs> strategy was developed, bringing climate change, transport, communications, legislation, together we've discussed in previously actions being taken under climate change which have impacted on air quality and one of the, the aims here is that to actually going forward making sure that decisions that we make for climate change purposes also have multiple benefits and improvements to air quality. Okay, thanks. And um, just just for the record and, and for the committee's uh, information, um, could you tell us what area of land uh, does an AQMA cover uh, and do you feel an AQMA designation is sufficient uh, to tackle air pollution? The area of an, of an air quality management area, it, it varies in size. It can, be one, it can be one street or it can be wider. Um, th than that. It just very much depends on what the, the, the monitors are showing and the evidence that um, on that. So as I say, it can very much vary um, in size, but generally based around the, the roads. So, for example, the non-transport emission AQMA that you mentioned in West Lothian, uh, is that just one street? Or? I'm a, I, I will get back yeah, with, with okay. that information on, okay. on that. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Let's move on. Uh, Richard Lyle. Yes, uh, convener. Um, Professor Colin Ramsey actually uh, put in his submission, Scotland has some of the strictest health-based air quality targets of any comparable country, does relatively well, but there's still room for further reduction in transport-related air pollution, especially in heavily trafficked urban areas. 
How would they suggest it would reduce this air pollution? What action should we take? Colin Ramsey. I think, <clears throat> well, that's what the whole Clear Air for Scotland strategy is all about. Um, it's about trying to set out uh, a set of measures to try to tackle transport-related air pollution, which is one of the potentially most preventable sources of air pollution that we have because it's generated by uh, our activities. And I say our because I think we all contribute to it in one way or another. So uh, I think that is the, the CAF strategy has set out uh, an approach to it which recognises the need to tackle um, the fundamentals of um, transport generated air pollution, and that's the amount of traffic on the roads and the mixture of traffic and the kinds of um, combustion engines that are being used um, and the, 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 the attempts to define the monitoring and modelling strategy an attempt to try to create a level playing field across the whole country so that people aren't being disadvantaged depending on where they are in terms of the um, sort of uh, actions that may be taken. But I think the most important thing about CAFs as well is that it recognises that it's not just tackling um, pollution at source, but it's about creating an environment where there, there are opportunities to change the kind of uh, the whole balance of um, transport behaviours amongst people and to make it easier for people to choose healthier options, i.e. cycling and walking and active travel, as opposed to always resorting to uh, a private car, for example. Um, uh, and obviously, changing to public transport is a way of reducing the total amount of air pollution because if you get people out of their cars, you're reducing the amount of uh, uh, emissions associated with that. So I think there's a whole range of options which are the attempt is in cast to set out what these options are, but they all have to kind of move along in parallel rather than necessarily focusing on one particular area uh, uh, to the exclusion of others, really. And I think it is very challenging for local authorities to try to uh, effect changes at local level um, which can make a big, a big impact. I think they're likely to be incremental impacts, relatively sm small impacts, quite difficult to measure impacts in many ways, but I think it will take time to do it, but I think it's an incremental process. Anyone else want to come in on that? Peter Chapman. Can I just ask you, we've heard how the diesel engine has is, is, is been proven to be much more polluting, polluting than we originally thought, but one of the things that's happening with the settling lorries and, and, and tractors and farms and bigger bigger diesel engines is the add blue technology, which cleans up the exhaust systems. Um, surely this is one way that we can help to, to clean up the, the, the diesel engine. I wouldn't claim to be an expert on uh, the technicalities of, of engine emissions and the control systems. Um, all I would say is, in relation to that, I think, yes, there are mechanisms to do that retrospectively to fit uh, even relatively dirty engines with... Um, uh, mechanisms to try to reduce the amount of pollutants. And, and I think there's been a steady progression amongst the car industry in terms of developing engines to try to do that. Catalytic converters and particulate filters and all the rest of it are ways that have they've been doing that. But I think that, that, that question is particularly important, I think, in relation to, for example, buses. Because I think one of the big, big issues, and I think David Begg, uh, who used to be in Edinburgh as a councillor, I believe, and is now recognised as an expert in transport pollution, I think, has written recently about the role of buses in terms of this whole picture and the fact that um, a, a lot of benefit could be achieved by retrofitting bustle, uh, buses with the technology to clean them up as opposed to having to everybody buy new buses which would be colossally expensive and probably couldn't be affordable by many um, organisations. So I think you're right, I think there is a role for um, a technological solution to it um, but that's in effect a kind of relatively short term solution. I think we're trying to look at the longer term solutions. Okay, uh, Fintan Harley. Just support and emphasise what Colin has said, the importance of policies that make it easier for people to avoid, for example, using cars. So public transport is one of them. Colin's submission also quotes from Clean Air, Cleaner Air for Scotland on what's called modal shift, and he mentioned it moving towards um, making it easier for people to walk and cycle. I think your next panel has probably more expertise on this, certainly, than I have. But uh, a commitment to spend a proportion of the budget on transport infrastructure, on making it simpler for people to walk and to cycle, would, would help push that and help move it from, you know, I call it a nice objective to something much harder. Mr. Thank you, Commissioner. An observation rather than a question. I think Peter Chapman is right to say that diesels are not all the same. I think the Euro 6 model, for example, are much less polluting. I think the wider political argument is it would also help if car manufacturers were honest and upfront about their testing of vehicles and not in the situation that we've had with Volkswagen and others who, frankly, have been 
uh, fraudulently involved in a system which has not been adequately checking vehicles. But I think the political solution, certainly from my point of view, is to have bus regulation, which involving local authorities have much more control over uh, buses. And it, in one sense, it's almost madness having in city centres having polluting diesel vehicles when we should be having the fleets of electric vehicles. Certainly in my own patch in Highlands and Islands, I know that stagecoaches have got a fleet of electric buses, which obviously are not polluting. So I think there's a way forward politically, but I understand to the academics here, this is not, this is not really a sort of policy question for them. It's more, what can we do in this parliament to ensure that pollution levels fall? And I think bus regulation is certainly the way forward. Uh, Richard Lyle. Uh, Fintan Hurley actually touched on my next question in regards to the Scottish Government's Clean Air for Scotland strategy, national modelling framework and national low emission framework. Uh, can the panel or does the panel have a view on the process for putting the NMF in place and how it support decision making around place making and transport planning in relation to air quality management? Fintan Hurley. I'll be honest, um, people in your next panel will have a much more informed view of that than I have. <laughs> Very honest, thank you. OK, Richard Lyle, do you have any other questions? Last question, Ken, we learned that thing. What, what would, uh, does anyone have a view of what the timescale for delivery of NLEF, whether the budget is adequate and how the evidence gathering will inform decision making? Janice Mill. Um, more appropriate for the, the, the second session. Thank you, panel. I may come back with those questions later. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's move us on. Uh, Emma Harper. Um, I'm interested in health and the impacts of pollution on the environment and health. Um, and written evidence that we received from Health Protection Scotland noted that the average levels of this harmful particulate matter, so PM size 2.5 or less, so it's lower in Scotland than the rest of the UK, but the deaths that are attributed to air quality or poor air quality is almost 3,000 a year. But it's hard to, I guess, quantify or directly relate those deaths associated with air pollution. So um, how can we accurately estimate the human impact of air pollution and how might the understanding of air quality and its multiple influences be improved. David Newby. Yeah, that um, question. Um, obviously, when people look at population risk and attributable risk, what they tend to do is look at proportionality and make a, a calculation. It's a bit like if the average blood pressure of uh, Scotland went up by two millimetres of mercury, the number of strokes we'd have would go up. Um, and so when you're looking at the quantification of the risk, it is applied to a population, and that's where those numbers come from, are uh, from the pollution levels, the background levels that we have. What Fintan earlier said earlier in terms of, um, uh, obviously, there's no absolute level that is safe, and if you look in within Scotland, the levels that we have, and you make some extrapolations, uh, then that's where the calculation comes from. So it's a ballpark figure. It tells you roughly what people are dying from. It's not actually cancer that was mentioned earlier on. It's usually more on my domain of, of heart attacks where people die. Cardiovascular disease is, is the main killer associated with air pollution. I forgot to mention my interest in I am the cross-party group co-convener for the Lung Health Group, mm -hmm. and my background as a nurse also. I think, um, you know, the, the deaths, people associate air pollution deaths with a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease exacerbation, but it is really interesting to hear about the cardiac deaths associated because the particulate matter that gets into the bloodstream, so it's not just the lungs. So I'd be interested to hear a wee bit more about just um, defining that, that is the air pollution yes, cause. Yes, of course. So, um, in fact, uh, the research that I got involved in over the last 10 years, funded by the BHF, was was actually working with people with lung disease. Um, so I went to colleagues that worked who were respiratory physicians who were treating people with COPD. And what was noticed was that people with COPD, yes, they were dying from uh, air pollution events, but actually from uh, heart attacks rather than they do have clearly exacerbations of their disease, but the actual mortality was attributed mostly to cardiovascular events, so heart attacks. Um, so uh, the associations uh, that we have seen have been, if you look at people who come in with heart attacks, you'll find that they're three times more likely to spend the last few hours in traffic, busy traffic, 
than not when they have a heart attack. Um, there is a, an association with triggering of heart attacks. Uh, and there's an association with uh, long-term exposures, making you more likely to have things like heart attacks and strokes. Uh, obviously, I'm talking about heart attacks because that's my field. Um, but the same has also been reported in respiratory disease uh, as well. Um, it was suggested in the written submissions we had that there's a suggestion through research that there are possible links between air pollution and obesity. Is this simply because breathing issues can lead to a lack of activity uh, being undertaken? Is there something more direct there? Yeah, it's difficult to demonstrate causality there. So, um, you know, if it's more polluted, you don't go out as much and maybe sedentary lifestyle, etc. So it's a little di difficult, but there, there has been some, um, believe it or not, animal models that have suggested that um, uh, the diet, risk of diabetes, what we call the metabolic syndrome, so that's a collection of obesity, diabetic tendencies, higher blood pressure and so forth, is much higher if you uh, expose animals to um, high levels of air pollution. So there does seem to be, on one level, some causal association. Um, and that has also been implicated as why potentially people are more likely to have heart attacks. Our own work has looked at um, how the blood vessels respond following controlled exposures to diesel exhaust, uh, including tractors, uh, but also uh, other uh, engines. Um, and certainly the effects of inhaling air pollution and uh, particularly diluted down diesel exhaust to levels that you'd find on the you know, Princess Street on a, on a still day um, uh, do cause problems with increasing blood clotting, uh, do cause problems of uh, the blood vessels becoming more tight and constricted. And also in patients with heart disease, we do see some worrying signs of increased stress on the heart when they're exposed to, to, to these uh, dilute diesel particles. Okay, thanks. Fintan Hartley, do you want to come in here? Yes, please. Can I make a couple of remarks on two things? One on the estimate of numbers of deaths and the other on the whole wide variety of things that David has been talking about that air pollution causes. So on the estimates of number of attributable deaths, I think we need to separate two things. One is what is the size of the public health problem in Scotland caused by air pollution? getting people to die earlier? And secondly, how many individuals are affected? And the reason it's important to separate these is that air pollution is one cause among many. So for an individual, you can't, or it's hard to say this person was killed by air pollution because there's so many other things that will have contributed to them dying earlier. Um, when, I mean, I chaired the group um, from the Committee on Medical Effects of Air Pollutants, the London-based committee that came up with the number of 29,000 estimated equivalent to uh, UK-wide with the corresponding number in Scotland. And we made that distinction. The way I think of it is, like, if air pollution shortens my life a little in years and years and years and years, it's really hard to say air pollution has killed any one of us. But if you add all of those together, the bit that my life has shortened in years and years and years, that's equivalent to killing more than 2,000 people a year in Scotland. You know, and when I say that, uh, it's as if, if we could take the same amount of loss of life and attribute it to a small number of people who were killed by air pollution only and nothing else, you'd get a number of about 2,000. So I think that that number is, I mean, there are uncertainties around the estimation, but I think it's a solid, it's a, it's a solid idea. And it's good for comparing with other things like road traffic accidents and so on, where you can be more sure about what's causal. Um, in the UK study, we came to an estimate of 29,000 deaths attributed to fine particles UK-wide. And we said, look, it's a bit of a guess how many individuals, it could be 200,000. So, you know, whose lives were shortened, a year, which is like a third of all deaths. Um, so in Scotland, if you took the same ratio, it might be 15,000 people a year whose lives are shortened by air pollution. I don't just mean living people, but of the people who've died, that air pollution made some contribu contribution to them dying earlier. But 2,000 is a better figure for comparing with other things because, uh, because of the fact that air pollution only operates to some extent with everything else. Did you come up with a figure, an estimate of the cost to the NHS annually? No. You didn't? No, we didn't. I'm, I'm almost certainly other people have. Okay. 
But okay. Uh, George Curley, do you want to add anything? No. Okay. Uh, David Stewart, a brief supplementary. If, uh, I was reading this morning about uh, an academic work from University of York from Knighton Howley, who said that uh, air pollution is equivalent to uh, a life-changing event such as bereavement and the effect that has on future health. Could you relate to that point? Um, I'm not familiar with it, and it isn't how I immediately think of it. So I think I'd stay agnostic on that. Yeah. Yeah. Ramsey, however, doesn't want to stay agnostic on it. <laughs> Come out and mention that one in my written submission. It's only one study, um, and I think you also always have to be very wary about findings in one study. If you set it in the context of other studies that have looked at similar things, I think the evidence base in relation to uh, health and well-being is poor in comparison to the very good evidence base that is on the physical effects of air pollution. Uh, and I think it was interesting, it was a headline-grabbing story, um, and they had a curious way of, of comparing it as, say, to a major life event like bereavement. I think uh, if you drill down into it, the, law, so the, the question raises more, the, 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 the publication raises more questions than it answers, in my view. Thanks. Uh, Fintan Harley, did you want um, We did review for Health Protection Scotland and SEPA the evidence on health and well-being in relation to air pollution policies. So if you think not so much of air pollution, but of air pollution policies like modal shift, like active transport, I think there's there's much more substantial evidence of benefits from policies that reduce air pollution than there is from the reduction of pollutants themselves. Thank you. Uh, Alex Bonnet. Yeah, you. Your Honours Convener, um, we can move on to sort of data, or rather more specifically the, the gaps in the data. Um, Health Protection Scotland notes that relatively little is known about how much pollution individual people are exposed to in their everyday lives. Uh, so can I just start by asking very briefly, uh, Dr. Ramsey to maybe uh, talk about the quantum of that gap and how significant it is, uh, and then to the, to the wider panel, uh, perhaps starting with Professor Newby, uh, about uh, how pollution might, how research might evolve uh, to consider individual exposure uh, and, and how we might go about developing a suitable approach for that. So I think, firstly, very briefly, Dr. Ramsey, about the, about the gap itself, uh, and, then, and then the rest of the panel on how we might uh, plug that gap. Thank you. Okay, cool. thanks for that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the point I made was that really our understanding of pollution, the distribution of pollution, is very much based on the concept that we have at the moment, which is largely fixed-based monitoring sites, and that is only relevant to the immediate locality of that monitoring site. It can be modelled, and, and there are very sophisticated statistical models which are used um, routinely, and that's what one of the strategies in the, the uh, CAFs is about developing a new modelling framework to allow you to uh, estimate what the pollution is at any given point in a, a, a neighbourhood area, for example, or at a school or whatever. But these are only modelled estimates, and some of them are pretty good at models. I mean, I'm not a statistician, but I think they are robust. Um, so although I'm saying we don't have individualised measures of pollution, we can model it to a significant degree. But I think the point is that um, I think people's experience of air pollution is radically different depending on their kind of everyday life cycle, really, and we don't necessarily have a terribly good handle on what that degree of variation is. We come up with kind of global estimates of what we think people are exposed to, but then, and then we come up with estimates of what that means in terms of health impacts, but they are very much estimates. You know, as has been said before, it's very difficult to pin down precisely for you or I what the exact effect on us as an individual is because of all the other factors which affect our health anyway. So I think there are, there's interest, for example, in people developing um, uh, personalized monitors. And there have been some studies done in Edinburgh uh, relatively recently looking at um, putting uh, individual monitors on and people and letting them walk around in their everyday lives and then measuring the variations in, in that. But it's quite a labour-intensive way of doing it. Um, there are uh, apps on the market where you can transfer your mobile phone into a monitoring device. There are question marks about the accuracy of these and how reliable they are. So uh, I think you know, there, there's potential for improving the gaps in terms of understanding. But I think, you know, it depends really what the purpose of doing that is to an extent. We could spend an awful lot of money trying to improve the understanding of individual experience, but we know that air pollution is bad for people. How much more do we really need to know about the effect on individuals before, you know, we, we have enough evidence to say we need to do something about it in a proportionate way? So, you know, I would simply pose that question back. Sorry, for, for, for the record, just to be clear, according to the Scottish Air Quality Database Annual Report, nitrogen oxide levels across the country away from roadsides are generally going downwards. 
So outside identified hotspots, can you quantify the scale of the issue we have? What I'm getting at is that is the increasing problem in urban settings far exceeding the decreasing situation away from roadsides? Again, it might be more appropriate for SIPA to comment on the details of, of the results of the monitoring, but I think that the issue of nitrogen dioxide is very much one related to hotspots, according to my understanding of it, not to the generality of the effects on the general population. Obviously, people move in and out of hotspots, and therefore they're exposed to high levels periodically. But, for example, uh, you know, lots of fo focus has been put on the Hope Street monitor, for example. To experience the level of pollution you get in that monitor, you would have to st literally stand by that roadside curbside for 24 hours a day for your life. Obviously, people don't get that. They get a variation on that. Um, so I think we have to try and bear in mind, you know, we do have hotspot problems and they need to be tackled, but that doesn't necessarily reflect the generality of what people are being exposed to. Okay. Um, Mark Roscoe and then Emma. Um, I'm just thinking about how robust the model actually is at the moment for, for monitoring because you know we will get for example hotspots outside of schools at school drop off and pick up times um, you know with engines running potentially quite vulnerable children uh, affected by that as well so you know is, is there not a, a case to have a much more widespread um, network of monitors and, and to increase the kind of granularity if you like of the of the data that we're getting back uh, Colin Ramsey Again, I think there have been some studies looking at, for example, putting monitors, some local authorities have done this. They've, they've put monitors at schools, and in fact, they, they have removed them because they have found that, in fact, they weren't able to demonstrate really marked increases. Obviously, the school run is a, a short period of time when the pollution levels will rise, the children then go into school, and that then dissipates. What's more concerning to me, actually, is necessarily the location of schools next to busy roads. And I think there is good evidence of associations with problems in proximity to, to busy roads. And what I've observed just anecdotally is, is in the school's rebuilding programme, for example, there appears to be a tendency to move new premises closer to main roads than actually the former schools were. And I think this is an interesting aspect about how to integrate planning policy with air pollution policy. And I think we're not necessarily paying as much attention to these aspects as we could. Okay. Emma. Just a quick question. Um, if we're having nitrogen dioxide monitors around hot spots or busy areas, maybe it would be an idea to have monitors on lollipop persons because they are in the hotspot areas in the AM and the PM, but then they go home, so we would be able to monitor their levels of uh, you know, nitrogen dioxide inhalation. Would that be something to consider? I remember there was a study done in Aberdeen on traffic wardens. It's more than 10 years ago. I can try and look it out and send you a link to it if you wish. It's just one of the things that's been brought up at the cross-party group about how do we look at best ways to monitor. There was a study done at the University of Leicester where a 14-year-old boy was given a backpack, so he wandered around school, home, bus, and from his um, analysis, it basically affected behaviour change, so the kids stopped hanging out at the bus stop and they moved to the swimming pool because less emissions uh, were registered at the swimming pool. Janice Small, I seem to remember from the evidence we took previously with SEPA that there's only a very limited number of these portable monitors available. Is that the case? Uh, this, is, this relates to uh, monitors that we make available to schools, yes. So um, we have at the moment 10, um, which we're able to, to allocate to, to schools. Generally, um, the way that they're, they're used, um, the children use them, but so we they, they will break because of that. So we're running about probably about six or seven available at any point in time. It is a very good way of educating children with respect to, um, we refer to, to traffic idling there. So you, yes, your, your levels go up. So there is something about um, behaviour change. We would, and we're aiming to increase those um, from 10 um, up to, to 20. We're just currently investigating um, funding options on that. We don't want to, to do more communication with respect to raising expectations until we have these in, in place. You talk about behaviour change. Do you mean parents not driving their yes. kids to school? Yes. 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 Right. OK, thanks. Um, can, I, can I just allow Claudia Beamish in here? Because I know Claudia is wanting to develop the theme about young people. Right. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, are there any further comments from the panel on how exposure to air pollution, particularly in early life, can be effectively addressed? Um, 
and what approaches are likely to yield the most benefit. We've touched on, um, this is me trying to use my new surface and it's gone off, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> just at the good, pertinent moment. We've touched on um, uh, directly tackling uh, traffic congestion, um, particularly from diesel engines and Peter Chapman's highlighted about uh, um, the possibilities there of retrofitting. Um, also, uh, there have been some suggestions just in policy terms about advising families to avoid busy streets at particular times, but this seems a bit kind of unrealistic and perhaps draconian, especially when you think of the school run. Mm -hmm. So um, either through, um, are, are there things particularly for uh, people in younger, in younger life that the panel would like to highlight at this stage? I mean, Fenton, Holly. Can I say again, and I support what Colin has said earlier, that the real most important thing is to bring down air pollution for everybody, rather than to develop strategies of dodging around the air pollution that is there at the moment. Um, I think David might have something to say for people who are particularly vulnerable, not just young people, but people with pre-existing illness. It's not really what I know and think so much about myself, but I know that there are ways of advising people to avoid various kinds of pollution hotspots. It, I, uh, um, just a few comments, really. Um, just to jump back a little bit, I was asked to comment on um, uh, personal monitoring, and I think we've covered most of that ground. We, we have done personal monitoring, uh, but that's to track with physiological effects. Uh, and of course, um, that's very helpful, but uh, for a population policy level, I'm not sure how helpful that is unless you've got a particular issue with a certain pollutant. Um, I think um, one of the things that you also don't capture in that is exposure. So you might be polluted, but if you're jogging through that pollution, your exposure will be three or four times higher because you're jogging and you're breathing faster. So even if the concentration doesn't change, your exposure goes up. And that, um, I suppose, touches on a little bit, uh, uh, again, what Finton was saying um, about vulnerable groups. So we have done some work. Um, uh, whilst it's not quite socially acceptable in this country to wear a face mask, we have done that in China. Um, we have done some interventions in patients who have heart disease. And certainly we've seen some beneficial effects of wearing a face mask to reduce personal exposures. Um, to reduce their blood pressure and also the stress that their heart's under. Um, so a simple face mask just for one day when walking around town can make a difference, but that of course was in the context of Beijing, where your pollution levels are many fold higher than we see uh, in Scotland. I think the current advice um, for patients with heart disease, for example, in the UK would be something around um, we encourage exercise, we encourage active lifestyle, but on a polluted day, perhaps that's not the day to do your jog or to go cycling uh, through the cent city centre. Uh, choose your days for exercise wisely. And that's the sort of level that we're at at this present moment in time. Okay. And I think one final thing, just to comment Sorry. on the school side of things, I just want to reinforce that point. The proximity to the road is probably the most important intervention that you want to think about in terms of t uh, town and country planning. A lot of evidence that the closer you live to the road, the more heart disease you have. And yes, children start to develop heart disease, uh, albeit very, very uh, mildly. But when you're in your teens, that's the first time you start to develop a thickening of your arteries. So this is important. Okay, Fenton Holloway. Thanks. I think it's worth remembering that the damage that air pollution does starts really early. It starts you know, for the unborn child during pregnancy. So there is a literature, I mean, increasing uh, research evidence, which I think is now solid, but I'm not really up to date with it, you know, that other things being equal, women who live in higher polluted areas have a greater risk of prematurity and of lower birth weight babies for the same age um, of, of at, you know, for the same number of weeks at birth. So it starts really early. And um, again, I can send a link to you if you like, or send you a, a copy. There's a recent uh, research report. Well, there, there's really quite solid evidence now that if you're, say, cycling um, in the kind of pollution we have here, you, as David explains, you increase your exposure because of your breathing, you increase your risk of traffic accidents, but you have gains from physical activity. 
and the gains from physical activity massively outweigh the disadvantages of the other two, except in some, like perhaps Beijing again, but like for Scotland, I think it's no contest. Okay, thanks. I think we've covered that quite well. Uh, Peter Chapman wants to move on to something completely different. Yeah, I would like to explore the impact of pollution on the, the wider environment. And we know that pollutants can travel long distances in the atmosphere before being deposited on our countryside, and the deposition of acid and nitrogen-rich pollutants can damage habitats by acidifying the soil and water and also by increasing the availability of nitrogen. Now, this can affect the type and number of species present. So the question is, what are the impacts on ecosystems of nutrient enrichment and acidification, and which ecosystems are particularly vulnerable to that? Janice Milne. Um, I think it's probably best if I come back with evident with details on the specific e ecosystems. Um, lichens, mosses, for example, are impacted by acidification. We know that um, forestry um, is something that's also been damaged by acidification. The recovery relates to the impact of the soil and its ability to actually neutralise that. So in southwest Scotland, we know, for example, it's taken to longer to recover from the impact of acid rain than other areas in Scotland because the, soil isn't as, the composition of the soil isn't as adequate to actually neutralise that. So while emissions of certainly SO2 and... Um, acid rain associated with SO2, we are seeing some reductions. The ability in different areas of Scotland, it, it varies with recovery, but on the actual specifics, <coughs> ecosystems, and I'll, I'll come back um, to you on that. Yeah, yeah that's useful. Uh, can I just, uh, how might air pollution from intensive agriculture be tackled? And, and, and do you think that environmental impacts tend to be considered of lesser importance than uh, health impacts? The issues from intensive agriculture very much relate to particulate matter, certainly if we're looking at intensive poultry. And it's one of the, the areas where we've put um, quite a bit of emphasis to actually evaluate. So we ask operators to, to model what we want to do is actually some monitoring to evaluate whether or not these, these <coughs> models are, um, are accurate. So particulate um, matter um, is an issue. We tend to focus particulate matter because of its health issues and we use that level and that then would allow us to, um, to demonstrate the, 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 the impact in the environment by using that level on, on health impact. So that, that's our focus at the moment. There's still probably, fair to say, quite a bit of work to be done. Where the issues are and the concern from intensive agriculture is where you have sensitive receptors. So when I, what I mean when I say that is sites of special scientific interest where conservation agencies say that these are susceptible to critical loading. So we've referred to um, ammonia before. What, what are they susceptible to? And getting um, an understanding from the conservation agencies of the ecosystems related to there. So we have controls over intensive agriculture. We need to do some more monitoring to evaluate how accurate the, the model is. Can I, just on the final one here, can I ask how much, how much air pollution in Scotland is estimated to come from the rest of the UK and, and, from, and from Europe? Is, is there any figures for that? Are there any ideas about how, that, how the pollutants move in the air? I don't have have the figure off, off the top of my head. Um, I'm sorry, I can, I can look if, into that. If there is any information, that would be useful there, to, um, to have it to hand. Uh, uh, Finlay Carson, briefly. Thanks, Camille. I, th I think we, we need to, uh, that's quite an important issue. We need to find out what uh, we can actually do. You know, you touched on the acid rain in Dumfries and Galloway and, and you know, very aware of uh, the damage that caused, but it wouldn't have mattered what... Um, actions we took to reduce or improve air quality in, in Dumfries and Galloway, we would still have the effects. So I, I think it's vitally important we know just how much control we do have over our, our air quality uh, in Scotland and, and what effect we can have in that. That's also true that air pollution in Scotland could be travelling elsewhere, so we still have that responsibility to tackle it. Mm -hmm. That's 
one of the reasons why we have the, the National Emission Ceiling Directive, which was put in place to implement the Gothenburg Protocol. So it relates to um, emission ceilings, mass amounts, ammonia, VOCs, NOx, um, SO2, in particular matter, setting actual quantities. So UK um, has a limit which we measure through our national emissions, um, sorry, our, our emissions in inventory. Um, we are below our targets, but it does rely on other Euro European countries and others meeting the Gothenburg um, Protocol as well. So, but that sets the, the, the limit on mass emissions. Okay, thank you. Let's move us on. Mark Roscoe. Yeah, thanks. Um, we've already touched on cleaner air for Scotland, Scottish Government strategy. Um, what do you see as the strengths and weaknesses of this strategy? One of, one of the strengths is, for the, for the first time, it brings together a number of different policy areas. So it brings together transport, climate change, communication, legislation, health. It's the first time that these policy areas have been brought together, and that was the prime, well, one of the first purpose of the strategy was it was cross-governmental. And it was also the fact that it wasn't just the environment minister that um, that, 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 that co-edited, um, it was also the, the transport minister. So for the first time, there was this recognition that this is not something that can be sorted in isolation. We need to get our land use planning sorted out. We need to make sure that when we are coming up with decisions on climate change, it is not having an adverse effect on air quality. We need to get the health messaging right. We need to, because it, the communication is so key, Air pollution is not something that you can you can see now. It's not dirty smoke that's coming out of a chimney. What is the best way to sell the multiple benefits of good air quality? So it, it's changing the modal shift, getting people out of cars, we mentioned before, getting them active travel. So that's the, the one of the, the key strengths was actually for the, first, for the first time probably ever you had that cross-policy um, group. It still is a early stage, we know that there's still a lot of you know, challenges to make sure that what we do moving forward gives us the biggest benefits. Where are its weaknesses? You could say that um, challenging targets and possibly knowing where the resource is um, going to come from to, to, um, to enable local authorities to fulfil um, the rules. So it's not necessarily a weakness. It's just, it's just I suppose, it's, it's, it's a challenge um, there. It's, it's the challenging timescales we have. Any other views on, on that at all from the panel? Well, I support what um, Janice has just said, um, and it's in the background papers too, about the importance of integrated policy making, and I think that's just hugely important. Um, I'm glad that there's a focus on exposure reduction for everybody rather than just hotspots and and a focus yeah um, and again I think the next panel will have a better informed view than I would have on uh, on, on implementation yeah. thanks I mean, Richard Lyle was a brief supplement yeah can I ask George Curley um, from NHS Lothian uh, do you monitor what, you know, when people arrive at uh, uh, a &E, uh, the reason why, any air pollution? And if you do, do you pass on the information to SEPA to show that there are hot sp other hotspots that have not been monitored? I'm not aware that we can take or, or collect any of that type of So data. NHS does not, NHS Scotland does not monitor anything in regard to air quality? I'm not aware. I mean, I think it's more a question for David, but certainly from my point of view, no. That's interesting. Thanks. Um, Colin Ramsey, briefly, and then we'll go back to Martin Roscoe. Yeah, I, mean, I think the question is trying to understand, are we, are we in some way trying to attribute what people turn up at A&E to what their circumstances have been prior to that? It's simply not practically possible to do that from an NHS perspective, because you're at the receiving end of it. Um, that relies on an understanding of the environment in which that individual has come from, and that's a very complex situation because it differs for everybody. Let's go back to the problem of the NHS fixes sick people as opposed to trying to tackle the preventative element of it. Um, 
Emma Harper. Similar, actually. Um, DEFRA have a UK air information resource. It's a pollution forecast provided by the Met Office. So basically, it's a pollution map. Um, are we not able to track high levels of air pollution and correlate that with the number of uh, unplanned hospital admissions? So, you know, we have a million a billion pounds a year spent in Scotland on lung health. And I know that's not all spent on um, lung exacerbations, but couldn't we use the pollution map to correlate hospital admissions? Hardly, so. There's a huge amount of studies worldwide, including some in Scotland. I can look out some, certainly in Edinburgh, I think probably in Glasgow, on what we call the effect of short-term air pollution. In other words, the day-to-day -day levels and how they impact on death rates in the immediately following days and on hospital admissions and on um, small changes to the functioning of the heart and the lungs and so on. There's a massive amount of evidence about that. Um, it, it, it isn't what's the main driver of the public health problem. The main driver is long-term exposure to everybody but it is an important piece and very important supporting evidence. And I, I guess say between David and myself or between David Collin and myself, we can give you some links to how that has been studied in Scotland and elsewhere. I'll have Colin Ramsey in briefly. You wanted to come back? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I think that covers the point adequately. Okay, that's fine. Mark Ruskell, do you want to develop this? So can, can I just comment you? that, you know, <coughs> um, what you can do associations, it's not necessarily causal, but um, one of the things that Scotland did do very well was um, uh, ban smoking in public places. Now, I know that's not what we're talking about today, but it is a form of air pollution, second-hand air smoke. And, of course, the legislation did see, as Jill Pell showed in Glasgow very nicely, that it reduced the rates of myocardial infarctions or heart attacks across Scotland by about 17% following the introduction of that legislation. And I think it's a nice example where policy decisions can actually have a very positive effect on health. And if we dream that we can get a less polluted, we can get diesel engine emissions down, which is what most of the Scottish population are exposed to. They're mostly urbanised. I'm not saying that we shouldn't worry about the rural aspects of what we're talking about today, but if you're looking at population level, that's where people live and work. Uh, they drive to work, uh, they take their kids to work. If we can get transport emissions sorted out, that's the real winner. And we have shown before we can make a difference. And I think where policy decisions can be really impactful. Very interesting. Uh, Mark, do you want to continue? Yeah, just leading on from that and coming back to the, um, to the cleaner air for Scotland strategy. Um, I mean, you mentioned earlier on about the, the lack of resourcing that local authorities have to actually take action on this issue. Is this an issue generally with transport? Are the right transport choices and incentives actually there? for people to take? Is this about investment in those policy choices in our infrastructure? Or is it about it's something else? When I referred to, to resourcing, I just mentioned resourcing overall um, is, is probably um, a challenge rather than one, than one specific um, area. I think um, I would refer to um, the second session for local authorities to, to comment on, um, on funding aspects there. Are you happy with that, Mark? Yeah, we'll come yeah. back to it. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's move it on. Uh, David Stewart. Thank you, uh, convener. Um, London has led the way with the introduction of uh, low emission zones, and as the panel we know, they're also planning ultra low emission zones in 2019. What evidence is there out there in the UK or beyond that the introduction of low emission zones are effective in reducing low uh, uh, local uh, pollution levels? If you want to pick up on that. I'm looking at Fintan Hurley. I, can, I feel like I ought to know, but it's not something that I'm really up to date with. So uh, I, I'm sorry. There would be two things. One is, what is, is there a demonstrated impact on air pollution concentrations? And then the secondary question is, is there a demonstrable impact on health as a consequence of that? And uh, I'll be honest. It's not an area that I've read into. Uh, on a related point, I kind of guess the answer to this question as well. Is there any evidence around the cost-benefit ratio? I, I, I picked up a figure from London that I think the scheme cost around 100 million to set up, 
Um, members will know and panel members will know that the scheme in London is done through camera system that recognises number plates. So if it's a Euro 6, there's no charge. If it's an older vehicle, which is more polluting, there is a charge. Uh, expensive setup, but obviously in London it's been argued that it's very effective. Uh, is there any evidence about cost-benefit ratios in this scheme at all? clinical uh, effectiveness in, uh, in England, which uh, provides guidelines, has recently looked at the evidence in relation to interventions on uh, air pollution and health, and they did review the evidence in relation to cost effectiveness, and they came to the conclusion that uh, there was evidence that it was cost effective, and they came out with a figure um, for that. So there is evidence there. Okay. David. From the panel about what other uh, interventions can be used. Uh, for example, um, a scrappage scheme for old diesel vehicles uh, to ban uh, diesel buses within urban areas and have electric buses, uh, and the use of consolidation centres, which are the Dutch model panels may be aware of, where heavy uh, polluting uh, delivery lorries go to uh, outside the city to deliver goods, and non-polluting electric vehicles are used to take the goods from the consolidation centre into the cities. I actually saw one uh, in the last session of Parliament, and it was an excellent model. I'm not suggesting these are zero sum. In other words, you can have low admission and you can have scrappage schemes, uh, but I would welcome any views from panellists on these various other options uh, which are put forward. Fintan Hordley. Um, as I say, look, this is an area I haven't really read into, but I think it's important to kind of implicitly in the question is the importance of making policy making not on a narrow basis, but kind of on the round. And um, one of my colleagues did a health impact assessment on a low emission uh, zone in London before its introduction. And when it went to public consultation, like, let me say first, I'm strongly in favor of them. But when it went to public consultation, one of the issues that came up was say, a small local charity who's running an old people carrier vehicle, taking older people to a lunch club or something. You know, if you ban that sort of a vehicle in air pollution terms without something like a scrappage scheme and a help to the charity to actually get a better vehicle rather than no vehicle at all, you've got health downsides as well as health upsides. Mm -hmm. So I just think that the schemes are really good in principle and they need to be thought a bit about for unintended consequences. Okay. Anybody else want to come in on this? Finley Carson. Just the back of that, convener, you know, the Scottish Government's draft climate change plan has undertaken to, to work with a local authority to introduce a, a LEZ. Um, can, the, can the panel uh, give their opinions on whether they think that's a positive move and, and what downsides might there be to that? There are no downsides. <laughs> More positives? Right, okay, thank you. OK, let's move to, to wrap this up. I'm just um, direct a question, particularly at David Newby and Fintan uh, Hurley. If you were to be given one thing that could be done to bring about noticeable improvement in, in health in the area of air quality, what would it be? In an ideal world, yeah. I'd like the centre of Glasgow and Edinburgh to be pedestrian zones with cycle pathways and not spend 1.95 billion on trams, but on cycle pathways that uh, make a city pleasant and enjoyable, gives you the physical benefit of health. Um, and most people, I, um, I'm going to be self-righteous now, I cycle to work, I always have, I cycle in a suit. So people who say they can't cycle because they wear a suit is nonsense. My wife cycles uh, to work. Uh, we barely use the car. These things can be done. And I think there is, if you get the right environment, uh, it can be done. Now, I know that's an easy thing to say and to convince lots of people to give up their car and get on a bike is difficult. But if we get the environment where a city centre, you can't cross easily with a car and you've, you've got lovely big uh, cycle pathways like they have in Holland, surely that's the way forward. That's my dream. And but, we would uh, get enormous health benefits from that? He would indeed, as okay. Fintan has already pointed out. And Fintan Hurley. I think my suggestion is social rather than environmental. So I think we're kind of along the way of it. I would say integrated planning, properly resourced, supported by political will, not only top down, but bottom up, which involves people understanding both the 
health and well-being issues and that something can be done about it, even though it is a complex issue. Uh, thank you very much. And can I thank all the witnesses in this first session? Can I also remind those who have undertaken to supply follow-up uh, evidence, if they could do that, that would be most appreciated. We're now going to have a short five-minute break to change over to the next panel, so I suspend for now.
Okay. So, uh, welcome back. We will need now hear from our second expert panel on the effectiveness of the policies and management strategies in relation to air quality in Scotland. Uh, we're joined by Amelia Hanna from Friends of the Air Scotland, Vince McNally from Sustainable Glasgow, Will Garrett from the City of Edinburgh Council, and Tom Rye from Napier University, and uh, Anna Heslop from Client Earth. Welcome to you all. Uh, as I said at the start of the first panel, if we could keep the questions and the answers short, we'll be able to cover uh, the great deal of ground that we have in front of us over the next hour or so. Um, can I ask uh, uh, panellists uh, what progress we have actually made in achieving air quality targets in Scotland over recent years? Um, what changes have we seen? What improvements have we seen? Um, and are we on track to be a European leader or otherwise on better air quality? Who wants to go first? Amelia Hanna. Um, um, well, just to put in context, we have uh, two streams of regulation on air quality. We've got the Scottish statutory standards and the European legal limits. And in terms of the Scottish standards, as we heard earlier, we have 38 air quality management areas. And those are areas where the Scottish standards are being broken long after a deadline. So uh, we've, 23 of these zones have been declared for, for particulate matter, and the deadline for the achievement of those standards was 2010. And 27 are for nitrogen dioxide, and the, the deadline for achievement under the Scottish standards was 2005. So I think it's fair to say that we are a long way behind where we need to be. Uh, we see this as a public health emergency because, as we've heard this morning, uh, the, the health impacts are incredibly serious. Um, we uh, know that Public Health in England has uh, calculated an attributable 2,000 early deaths every year from uh, fine particles, PM 2.5. Um, you asked the question about the cost of that. Um, DEFRA has, has undertaken a, a cost uh, impact assessment uh, and have found that uh, the cost across the UK as a whole is 16 billion every year. So when we calculate that roughly on a Scottish basis, we're talking around 1.1 billion pounds every year to the Scottish economy from days lost at work and cost to the NHS. So this is a significant health crisis and one that we need to tackle much more quickly. Um, I think Anna will be able to talk uh, in more detail about the European legal limits, um, but just to, to set the scene, uh, European law required uh, us to have, to reach a, a limit uh, for nitrogen dioxide by 2010, we're now 2017, and uh, four parts of Scotland uh, are in breach of that binding legal limit. So for the purposes of European law, Scotland is divided into six zones, and in four of those areas, we are in continued breach of European law. So we see that we are well behind where we need to be, um, and we need much tougher action, specifically on transport. And I think we can, we can point the finger quite firmly at transport, traffic, and use of the private car. Well, beyond, well behind where we need to be, um, but how does that compare to the rest of Europe? Not to offer excuses, but I'm just looking to, to get a, a kind of picture here. Um, well, in terms of the UK as a whole, and Anna might correct me if I'm wrong, I understand, is it 23 zones? No, so, um, <clears throat> sorry, there are 43 zones in the whole of the UK, and 37 of those are in breach of the limit values for NO2 at the moment. Uh, we are by no means the only member state that's in breach of the NO2 limits. Uh, there are, I think, 23 member states in breach of either NO2 or PM or both. Um, so it's not the case that Scotland is the only place in Europe breaching the limits, but I would not say that you're uh, doing better than anyone else in Europe either. OK, it's useful to get that quantified. Vincent McAnally. Uh, thanks. Um, well, we can certainly give a, a perspective on, on Glasgow as our, our largest city and what the, the air quality is like there. Um, it's fair to say, um, you know, air quality is presenting a very real risk to public health uh, today. However, you know, to get things in perspective, air quality within Glasgow uh, is the cleanest it has been since the Industrial Revolution. Um, we now have 
over 97% of the city meeting all air quality targets, including the Scottish objectives, which, as we know, are the most stringent in uh, Europe and uh, more stringent than the rest of the UK. Um, we have seen a continual improvement and decrease in pollution levels being recorded across the city over the last five years. We have no exceedance of particulates objectives anywhere in the city. Uh, and to, to pick up on a point you made earlier on about how does that compare to Europe, um, that's really good compared to Europe, where uh, you know, they are experiencing particulates of PM10 uh, uh, over 30 micrograms per metre cubed. In Glasgow, we are getting levels between 15 uh, and 16 micrograms per metre cubed in our worst areas. So um, there are problems with air quality within the city. They are relatively localised to areas where there is um, high levels of traffic, but uh, to be uh, to be uh, realistic about it uh, and to answer the question, which was about how have we been progressing over the past few years, uh, the answer is uh, that it has been improving continuously. Okay. Does anybody else want to come in? We'll get it. Um, thank you. I think I would reflect um, the comments made by Vincent uh, with respect to Edinburgh. I mean, we're by no means complacent about the situation, but it is an improving picture that we're seeing. We have six air quality management areas, uh, one for PM10s uh, and five for NO2, and the five for NO2 all show an improving picture across the city. So the general context is one of an improving picture. Um, as I say, we're by no means complacent, and there are a whole range of issues that we need to address in terms of trying to deal with the exceedances that we have in, in those areas. But it is against that picture of an improving situation. OK. Anna Heslop. So it's just worth recognising that whilst the uh, situation is improving, the problem is that it's a public health emergency and the situation is not improving fast enough. So what the directive says is that you must uh, meet those emissions limit as soon as possible in as short a time as possible. And that's not what's happening at the moment. So, so that uh, Clean Air for Scotland strategy was prepared in 2015. Um, it fed into air quality plans which were prepared at UK level by the Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs in London. Um, those plans uh, were... To, the, the High Court told the UK government in November last year that those plans were not adequate and they've been sent away to redo them because they're not aiming to reduce uh, the um, air, air pollution as soon as in as short a time as possible. So it's worth just bearing that in mind. And my understanding is that the, the Cleaner Air for Scotland strategy is not currently under review. Those new air quality plans, which were ordered by the High Court in November, were due to have come out last Monday. They are now going to come out on the 9th of May. Um, and it would be very disappointing if Scotland's ambition has not increased. Mm -hmm. OK. Angus MacDonald, do you want to come in on this? Uh, I'm just picking up on the, the, the issue of uh, AQMAs. You, you, you've you've um, heard me mention to the, the previous panel uh, about the sulphur dioxide issue in, uh, in Grangemouth, and it had helped to concentrate mines, particularly with Ineos, who invested £30 million in a, a sulphur recovery tail gas unit. Um, now, would you agree that uh, uh, that particular AQMA, um, at the risk of being parochial, um, was the, the driver which in, encouraged Ineos to, to, to take that action? And particularly, uh, I'd be keen to hear from uh, uh, Amelia Hanna, because I know she's shown a significant interest in the past uh, with regard to the issues in Grangemouth and, and other hotspots in Scotland. Certainly, I'm pleased to hear that progress is being made in the Grangemouth AQMA. Um, if I can maybe reflect more generally on uh, AQMAs and, and what the regime requires of local authorities, um, they can certainly be useful in focusing minds and raising awareness. Uh, the, uh, they're under the Scottish uh, statutory system, the Local Air Quality Management System, which is um, governed by sections 84 and 85 of the Environment Act. Um, they place an obligation on local authorities to monitor and declare air quality management areas where there is a risk of exceedance of the standards. However, there is no overall duty on local authorities to achieve the targets. 
Um, so we have something of an accountability gap and perhaps that's the reason why um, since the local air quality management uh, regime came into existence, we've only ever had four air quality management areas that have been revoked. Um, now, we don't necessarily think that the buck needs to stop with local authorities, but they should certainly be given more support by Scottish Government to implement effective measures. Um, and one of the weaknesses that we can see in air quality action plans is that often there are a range of measures proposed which don't necessarily tally up or show what the expected reductions in any given pollutant are meant to be. Um, so if we look at Glasgow's Air Quality Action Plan, for example, um, we can't necessarily say, OK, if we take all of the measures in the plan, this is going to add up and this is going to secure compliance with the standards. Um, so there's, there's, there are gaps within the system, certainly. Oh, Vincent, I can allow you to come back on that. Um, yeah, well, particularly just um, since we were discussing uh, air quality management areas, it's worth noting that uh, the entire administrative boundary of Glasgow was declared an air quality management area for PM10 at one point because levels of PM10 across the city were above the objective. Improvements in air quality have seen that now revoked. So we now have three separate uh, areas that are air quality management areas, and we will be moving this year to revoke the Parkhead Cross Air Quality Management Area because levels of uh, nitrogen dioxide within that area now meet the objective. So we are reducing air quality management areas as a result of improvements in air quality. Okay. Uh, Mark Ruskell, do you want to develop this general um, theme? Yes, Kavir. I mean, if I could just go back to the, the client's earth um, legal challenge in the High Court. Um, to what extent did that challenge focus on the Scottish Government's strategies or was it entirely focused on the overarching UK strategy? So it was focused on the overarching UK strategy. Um, uh, the, the UK government is responsible for preparing that, that air quality plan at national level, um, and what, but the Scottish government is responsible for meeting the limit values in Scotland. That's my understanding of how that, that breaks down. Um, so that plan is, is co-authored by Scottish government. It has uh, your logo on it. Um, and it uh, is obviously there is some feed in into that system behind the scenes, but the challenge was again uh, the Secretary of State in London. So in order to meet these compliance levels for nitrous oxide, um, particularly in areas like Glasgow, which are, which are breaching, um, what do you think needs to change in the Scottish Government strategy in order to actually deliver that objective? So, so the Scottish Government strategy uh, aims for a date of 2020. It's, uh, it's not entirely clear how that date is, is come to in the Cleaner Air for Scotland strategy. Um, one of the criticisms that the High Court had was that the date was not sufficiently uh, close, that the UK government had gone for across the entire strategy. And uh, that was partly because of the way that they had decided to do their modelling. So we heard about modelling in the last session. There are two different types of modelling you do. You do modelling to work out what the current air quality situation is based on the monitoring that you have, and then you uh, model that across the country. But in the context of air quality plans, you also have modelling of what air quality will be like going forward and what the different measures, the impacts that different measures will have on air quality going forward. And they had modelled that with a sort of aiming for 2020 and 2025 as dates for compliance. The court said, that's not good enough. You have to do it as soon as possible. That could be 2018 or 2019. So that's one weakness that I would see in that uh, Cleaner Air for Scotland strategy. Um, the other thing that the UK government did, and, and it's not clear from the Cleaner Air for Scotland strategy to me whether this has also been the approach of the Scottish government, is they modelled uh, based on emissions factors for diesel vehicles um, that were overly ambitious. So we know that in real world driving, vehicles are not emitting uh, the amounts of pollution that they uh, show in laboratory conditions. And they were basing their modelling on laboratory conditions, what diesel vehicles ought to be emitting, rather than what they knew they are actually emitting in real world conditions. So I don't know with the Scottish plan, because it's not clear um, from, from the information available, whether that's also a flaw in the Scottish uh, input. Are there any other thoughts on, on that from around the, the table at all? Yeah. I, uh, I, mean, I think Clean Air for Scotland on the transport side is rather weak in several specific areas, uh, particularly freight, if we think about the contribution of HGVs 
to, to air pollution. Um, <clears throat> the the uh, does Clean Air for Scotland really only has policies which are regarding encouraging freight operators to take up cleaner practices, and I think there's clear evidence from other European countries that it's possible to do more than that. Um, I can go in, go later into what you could do. Um, another, another area where I think it's um, it's rather weak, weak is on trunk roads. Um, local authorities are not the only ones who uh, control roads. Transport Scotland controls roads. One third of air quality management areas have a trunk road running through them, and they carry a higher proportion of heavy vehicles than uh, than the local roads. And uh, <clears throat> once again, in, in regards to trunk roads, Cleaner Air for Scotland is. It really doesn't make any commitments whatsoever, really, apart from one specific air quality management area in Grief, where, in fact, actually, it then puts the onus on the local authority. So, you know, there are, there are several areas I could go into further detail where I think the Clean Air for Scotland is very weak on transport and uh, isn't planning to do enough, fast enough. OK, Amelia Hanna. Um, yeah, I would echo the points that have been made about uh, Clean Air for Scotland being weak on transport. Um, also, that it includes very few new policies, and what was clearly required from the Supreme Court ruling was new measures which showed increased ambition on tackling air pollution. Um, one of the main things that Clean Air for Scotland introduced is a national low emissions framework, um, which is an appraisal process um, by which measures could be identified which would tackle air pollution, including things like low emission zones. Um, so that could have been useful, um, but it has been running behind schedule uh, a fair bit. So. Um, under, I think it's LP10, one of the actions in Cleaner Air for Scotland, the national low emissions framework, uh, by April 20, 2016, the criteria tests processes uh, were meant to have been developed, agreed and finalised, um, but we're now in 2017 and the NLEF has yet to be consulted on. So it has become something of a stumbling block towards the delivery of the Scottish Government's ambition for a low emission zone uh, by 2018, which I should say is something that we support. Um, so, so progress has been, has been quite slow through Clean Air for Scotland. Um, another weakness, again, is that it doesn't quantify uh, what the impact of the 83 policy measures uh, that it proposes to introduce would be. So there's no way of knowing, does this add up to, to delivery of the, of the legal limits by 2020? Vincent McNally. Um, I was just to pick up on a point Mark raised um, or asked uh, in relation to the emissions factors that go into the modelling. Um, yeah, it's true that vehicles do emit more in the real world environment than they do in the, in, in the, as they are lab tested, if you like. But the emissions factors are revised to take account of the evidence that's become that becoming aware of in relation to that. Mark Russell, you got anything else? I, I'm struggling to understand what the Scottish Government should be doing ahead of, was it the 9th of May? Yeah. Uh, I mean, that, that seems like a, a very tricky deadline for the Scottish Government to meet. What, what, what do you think they should be doing right now? Well, uh, my understanding and the evidence that the uh, UK Government gave to the court last week is that those plans are ready. So they have already been prepared. So uh, I'm not sure the Scottish Government can do anything between now and the 9th of May. Um, I, I'm very surprised that following that High Court judgment in November last year, there was no review of the Scottish uh, plan. Um, I, I, I very much hope that the Scottish Government has been discussing with its colleagues in Westminster uh, what ought to go into this new revised air quality plan, um, but I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of what's been going on behind the scenes. Um, there are... On. There may have been, there may have been, but there are certain things in that Clean Air for Scotland plan which, which you would want to relook at um, on the basis of the High Court judgment. I mean, as well as those uh, issues that I mentioned earlier, in terms of your um, national low emissions framework part of that strategy, it talks about a business case. And the High Court was very clear um, that, that that is not something that you ought to be taking into account. Now, that's a, that's a fairly large chunk of that, that national low emissions framework. Are the UK government accepting that High Court ruling? They the haven't appealed it. They haven't appealed it, right? Nope. That's fine. Right, Tom Ryan. 
Uh, perhaps this is uh, too quickly to do before the 9th of May, but I think that uh, the, the, the Cleaner Air for Scotland really needs to incorporate stronger measures on low, low emission zones, and that if we wish to be a leader in Europe, then uh, we should follow the example of some quite a number of our European counterparts, Italy, Germany, Sweden, in having a lot, well, having more than one low emission zone in the whole of the United Kingdom, um, and they can be introduced, and they can be introduced with, you know, without enormous political upheaval. Um, so. I'm very surprised that the Clean Air for Scotland doesn't take a stronger lead on that, because ultimately the legislation under which they would be introduced would be legislation on which the well, the decisions would have to be finally approved by the Scottish Government in any case. Um, so I think that's what should be in there if we want to do more. Richard Lyle. Thank you, Convener. Uh, can I turn to air quality governance effectiveness of current policy support and incentives and uh, data collection? Amelia Hanna and Anna Hislop um, said there's a public health emergency, but George Curley for the NHS says that they don't really gather data regarding local reporting and pollution. Do we have the right policies in place? Are they sufficiently ambitious? Are they being effectively implemented and successfully addressing the issues? And should the NHS be involved more? Over to you, ladies. Well, uh, so to pick up on, uh, was it monitoring specifically or our understanding of oh, air quality? That. I think something that maybe was overlooked in the, over, uh, in the earlier session is that we do have uh, a, a very detailed uh, network driven by the local authorities um, based on diffusion tubes. So we have the 95 automatic monitoring stations, which tell us what air quality is like on an hourly basis. We also have little cost-effective bits of kit that can, can show what the situation is on the ground in more depth. Um, and I should say that in relation to Glasgow and the city centre, uh, we know that last year, I think 17 of the 28 locations where ni nitrogen dioxide is monitored were in breach of the Scottish standard. So we do have quite a, a detailed picture. Um, local authorities also have done some excellent work in source apportionment, so understanding where the, where the main sources of air pollution come from in the urban setting. Um, and uh, we know that in the urban setting, traffic is the dominant cause. Um, I think across the UK as a whole, on average, 80% of uh, urban nitrogen dioxide is from traffic. Um, Edinburgh Council have, have done an excellent uh, further assessment report, it's called from 2013, um, which tells us where the sources of, of the pollution is. And um, we know from that report, for example, that only between five and seven percent of the nitrogen dioxide is from regional background sources. So a lot of the, a lot of the urban pollution is uh, caused by traffic and it is within uh, the local authorities, the Scottish government's control uh, to be able to do something about. So I think we do have a sufficient evidence base that shows us that traffic is the dominant cause. Uh, what we still have is a lack of political will and specifically um, a lack of ambition on demand management. Um, and I'd, I'd like to point the finger at, at cars, if I may, because uh, again, from Edinburgh's source apportionment work uh, from tw 2013, we know that cars, in many cases, are the dominant cause of pollution. In some insta instances, it can be buses, um, but a lot of the time, those buses are caused to idle, they're trapped in congestion, which is caused by cars. Um, so we need... Cars, it's actually people who cause pollution by driving them. Well, <laughs> precisely. But we certainly need the policies in place, and I take yeah. your point, to, to help people to make the, the right choices. Um, and, and, you know, the priority areas that we see uh, are for cutting car use by um, enabling workplace parking levies, stricter parking control, controls. Um, we want to see an, a rollout of 20 mile per, per hour zones being made the, the default in urban settings. Um, we want to see congestion charging looked at and we want to see a strong network of low emission zones, not just in one city, but in all of the major cities with air pollution problems uh, and particularly low emission zones that will support buses to make the transition to, to cleaner emission standards. All of which requires buy-in from the public and significant behavioural change. 
I mean, I think that the, there has been a lot of awareness raising over air pollution in the last few years, and I think that the public is, uh, is on board with the fact that it is a problem. Um, certainly, uh, it's, it's always difficult to, to have measures which specifically uh, attack the car, um, but there are other measures which, which I think the public would support. So last week, for example, there were over a thousand people who came to the Scottish Parliament saying we want more investment in cycling and in active travel. Uh, we know that cycling is a big part of the solution. Um, again, with public transport, the sector is in decline. That's something that needs to be looked at. Um, if we can get more buses on the roads, that could be a big, uh, a big way to overcome congestion. We know, for example, that one double-decker bus uh, could take up to 75 cars off the road. Um, so these are, these are the things that need investment. And we've got to remember with the car that 30% of households in Scotland don't actually have access to a car. In Glasgow, it's 50%. Um, so there are a lot of people out there who are trapped in transport poverty, who need uh, better public transport, better access to, to walking and cycling options, um, and this would benefit air quality as well. Craig McLaren. Yeah, thanks, Convener. Uh, obviously come from a specific background, uh, coming from the Royal Town Planning Institute, but one thing I think we really welcomed about the strategy is the fact that it has put a major emphasis on placemaking. Um, we heard earlier on from the session um, about the need to create healthy places for people. Uh, so that's great. I think the, the issue with have with that is, uh, is sometimes the idea of trying to think about places is overlooked uh, at a local level, and we tend to look at things in terms of programmes, strategies, initiatives, disciplines, rather than how, the, how all these different things work together at the same time to create that, that, that place to be much more proactive, much more um, uh, forward-thinking in, in how we do that. So th there's, there's some very, very good hooks in there. Um, to try and make sure that placemaking works, but at a local level, we need to try and make sure that that, that approach, that strategy, that mindset is actually implemented. Did you recognise the comment made in the first panel about the location of new schools being predominantly near major roads? Yeah, well, I, I don't know the details of whether that's the case or not. The interesting thing for me about that was that um, provision of new schools is more than a planning issue. It's an asset management issue. It's a finance issue. And what we've tended to find is that um, your, your head planner uh, is not always involved in some of those discussions, discussions at the start of the process. So the placemaking element's not there. It's very much deciding on a financial thing or an asset management basis as well. So we actually put out some proposals recently as part of the planning review for a, uh, we're calling a chief planning officer to be a statutory post in each local authority. And they are someone who is consulted early and engaged with early in the process mm -hmm. so that we can figure out what the implications and ramifications are of a decision, be it on an asset or an investment. So there's a need to try and push that much more uh, front-loaded and much more upstream in the process. Okay, thanks. Tom Rye. Yeah. I was just going to um, raise very briefly the issue of the politics of introducing low emission zones. Um, as I said before, Germany, most medium and large sized towns have a low emission zone. How does that low emission zone function? Essentially, it bans vehicles, bans private cars and commercial vehicles that um, don't meet certain emission characteristics and or imposes a charge small daily charge on those vehicles that don't. Um, so it's requiring people to either change their vehicle or retrofit their vehicle or simply not drive into that area. Now, I'm not aware of a wave of uh, political disasters in uh, German local politics arising from the introduction of these low emission zones, which have been going on since the early 2000s as far as I'm aware. Similarly in Italy, and most Italian cities have some form of low emission zone. Um, the people in these countries are accepting these changes. Also, in terms of the economic impact, um, I think freight operators will also will always um, raise the economic impact of any regulation that might require them to upgrade their vehicles. Uh, clearly, countries like Germany and Sweden have continued to be economically successful whilst introducing um, stricter air quality management regulations than we have. So I think we need to be circumspect about the uh, possible political impacts or the political difficulty of introducing certainly low emission zones. Um, and there needs to be some speed, well, some, some, there needs to be steps taken very quickly to get more low emission zones in place. Um, just a couple of points to pick up on. I mean, I echo Emilio's comments about the, um, the, the monitoring and data collection that we have. I mean, we have extensive ability to report on what the current levels of air quality are. Uh, you know, within our cities. Um, but the, the source apportionment work that we've been doing or that we have done in, a, in 
uh, working with SEPA, has thrown up some interest in uh, facts and figures about what's polluting certain streets. And it does vary quite a bit within the city. So, for example, in Hope Street, where we have the most polluted street within Glasgow, we know that 70 to 80 per cent of that pollution comes from the buses. Um, on other streets, such as Great Western Road, we know that it's around about 70 per cent of the pollution on that comes from cars. So it depends what the traffic is on a particular road, and we really need to focus on where we want to clean up and the, and the, and the, and the part of the fleet that's maybe better to focus efforts on, first of all, because Great Western Road meets the air quality objective. So, you know, it's kind of clear what we can be targeting there. Um, we want to see buses cleaned up uh, for other reasons in, in terms of just meeting the, the, the targets. We want people to use public transport. The people that are on the buses are travelling into it are exposed to more pollution than the people that are in the cars that are just that are travelling quicker through that area and it don't stop regularly with the door open with the engine running while people come on and off the bus uh, the bus drivers the taxi drivers that are travelling through these areas are exposed to higher levels of pollution so it's important that, that, that these uh, parts of the fleet are cleaned up in terms of acceptability uh, this is just my own personal view. Uh, I would see that the public are, are, are always going to be accepting low emission zones as long as it's somebody else that's having to clean up their fleet. I think it is going to be, uh, if we are going to talk about privately owned vehicles not being compliant, that's a difficult decision for anyone to take to say your diesel vehicle is six years old and now does not comply with the emission standards because we're talking about Euro 6 for diesels, Euro 4 for petrol. So you're talking about V diesel cars that are really only a couple of years old being satisfactory to get into a low emission zone, that's going to be quite a challenge to sell that to the public. Um, I know in Germany and, uh, and across Europe there has been more acceptance of low emission zones. They are starting at a different place. As I mentioned earlier on, levels of particulate pollution in mainland Europe are far higher than they are uh, in Scotland. And that may be the driving factor that has, has seen that accepted. In addition, Germany has handed out a lot of grants for uh, uh, commercial fleets to be upgraded and for uh, scrappage deals for um, uh, people to replace older vehicles. And I know scrappage was mentioned earlier on. I would just say briefly on scrappage that um, you know the, 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 there can be an unintended consequences of, of things like scrappage deals. The past scrappage deal that was introduced for cars saw people get rid of older, relatively low polluting petrol cars and have them replaced with diesel vehicles, which we now know causes a problem. The other thing is a general scrappage deal everywhere doesn't focus effort on the areas where we have air pollution problems. If you're driving a diesel vehicle out in the middle of the countryside, the impact it's having is negligible. It's where it's within the city centres that we have problems with diesel. We're getting into the low emissions zones. I'm going to let Dave uh, Stewart come in on this now and develop that for you in a second. But presumably, um, if we talk about a small charge for private car users, users going into low emission zones, uh, and that would perhaps drive behavioural change, equally, if you were charging polluting buses to go into these zones, that would drive change in the practices of the fleet owners. They might go and uh, introduce hybrid buses, electric vehicles, etc. So would you see that being a possibility? Uh, I think a low emission zone could be the, the, the stick that's needed to, to have fleets improved. In the past, uh, Glasgow's offered grants for bus operators to fit uh, abatement technology to their uh, buses that would bring an old Euro 3 bus up to the almost the uh, Euro 6. And this would be in addition bus. to the green bus fund that the Scottish Government This was runs. in addition to yeah. that, yes. Um, and we didn't have any bus operators in the city take us up on that. It was 80% of the cost of the funding that we would provide and nobody took it up. So there's the potential for grant funding on the one hand and a low emission zone on the other hand to, to encourage fleet operators to improve their vehicles. Okay, that's interesting. Um, Tom Rye and then Amelia Hanna, then David developing it. Yeah, um, one, just some data from a large um, low emission zone in Germany, Berlin, 1.1 million residents, 85 square kilometres. It's only, it's quite old data this, I'm afraid, but uh, when it was uh, introduced in 2008, within the year, within the first year, there was a 35% fall in particulate matters and 19% fall in uh, nitrogen oxide concentrations. Um, so that was that, that covers cars as well as commercial vehicles. On um, on buses, um, <clears throat> the, it's very difficult 
to encourage operators, as we heard, even if there are incentives, incentives available to change their fleet, if you have no direct control over their fleet, of course, we should remember that in the rest of continental Europe, um, buses are either directly owned by the public sector or uh, secured under franchise contracts, and that gives far, far more uh, possibilities and control to the franchising authorities to, to um, improve the emissions characteristics of the buses. So, for example, in Skåne in southwest Sweden, um, which is an area of about 1.25 million people around Malmö, but with quite a lot of characteristics similar to Scotland, actually, um, that, that area there has an almost completely biogas fleet because it is a, a franchised arrangement. Now, how much does that cost in terms of subsidy into the bus industry or public money into the bus industry on a per head basis is about 90 pounds a year, whereas in Scotland we put in about 60 pounds a year into our bus industry. Uh, the, bus, the, bus, the Clean Bus Grant has enabled 469 buses of probably about a fleet of about 8,000 buses across Scotland to be improved, but quite a lot of those are improved to Euro 5 or Euro 6 diesel, not to anything cleaner than that. So in, in, in Sweden, there's this, well, in that part of Sweden, there's an order of magnitude change in the emissions characteristics of the buses, which frankly has been brought about because of the different regulatory system. You've got a transport bill that's likely to go through the Scottish Parliament soon, and uh, I trust that it will take on board uh, a lot of the, uh, the parts of the buses bill that's just been uh, made law in England, which will allow local franchising of bus services and therefore control or more control over the nature okay. of the bus fleet. Okay, it's a really important issue, but we're getting caught up in it. Sorry. Lot. Can I let uh, Will Garrett in, because he's been trying to catch my attention for some time. Um, thank you. Just on the bus issue, very briefly, um, where Edinburgh is a partner in the ownership of uh, Lothian buses, by the end of this year, 75% of the bus fleet will be Euro 6 or better. So that sense of having an opportunity to influence what happens is, is important. I just wanted to go back to the source apportionment discussion. Uh, and uh, it's right, we do have a good understanding now of what the issues are in which particular AQMA. And that does mean we can uh, think about how to address the particular problems. And uh, with, there are, if you like, three forms of traffic that make up uh, uh, the problem. One being buses, and as I say, with a partnership with the buses, we can uh, ensure that the fleet is in, in relatively good order, and the better buses, or the more of the least polluting buses, will then be the ones that go through the AQMAs. So we can address the issue of bus pollution through that process. With lorries and vans, we have a, a, a program which is um, more a voluntary one, something called EcoStars, where we work with them in terms of how they develop their, their routing and their driving to, to try and essentially to try and produce fewer miles per, per lorry or van. The real issue is, uh, as has been said, with cars where it's, there's no kind of partnership that can be um, brought about with individual people other than persuasion. I mean, we have a raft of planning policies that we do use to try and encourage um, a shift from car ownership, a modal shift, as, as has been discussed, um, and promoting electric cars and a range of other things, which uh, no doubt we'll come to later on. But uh, in a broad context of what the problem is within the AQMAs, cars is the one thing that we have more difficulty with okay. than the other forms of transport. Briefly, Amelia. Um, yeah, just to echo the point, I think Edinburgh's population is expected to grow by 28% by 2037, so we need to think about how to make the most efficient use of our road space. One thing that Edinburgh Council is not able to do is uh, introduce workplace parking levies or any levies over large parking spaces because the, the um, legislation does not exist through the Transport Act. So uh, one plea that, that we would make uh, to, to Parliament is that when the next transport bill is passed, it needs to make it possible for local authorities to, to levy uh, workplace parking levies. Stuart. Thank you, uh, Convener. There's been a lot of discussion, rightly, about low emission zones. I'm particularly interested in asking our two local authority representatives and indeed other witnesses about how discussions are going with Scottish Government over low emission zones. Would either of you be in a position to be the pilot uh, next year when it's due to start? I'll start with uh, uh, Mr Garrett. Um, 
discussions discussions have been ongoing. I think the the issue we've had or the point we've come to is not that we are unwilling to participate in this. In fact, Edinburgh is willing to do it. Um, we need to understand what the resource implications are going to be for that. Um, it's, it would be an additional cost on the local authority, and we just need to have a better understanding of what that implication is, um, and specifically the nature of how a low emission zone mm. would work, mm. uh, whether it would be focused on buses or on uh, cars as well. And as I say, in Edinburgh, buses are not such an issue as cars, mm. and that makes it difficult without introducing uh, number plate recognition, which, uh, as we heard earlier, is a very expensive yeah. process. Mm. That, thanks. That's very interesting. I've done quite a lot of work looking at the London model, and as you know, they're bringing in the ultra Low emission zone in 2019. You would have heard the ev earlier evidence where I think I'm correct in saying that the figure to set the scheme up uh, in London, uh, initial scheme is 100 million using camera technology to detect the license plates of vehicles and finding which are Euro 6 or other and charging them thereafter. I mean, that's a huge amount of funding. Uh, have, you, have you had any discussions with that level of detail? Will there be a, a, a camera recognition system for the pilot next year? Do you know that level of detail? I don't know that level of detail. I'll perhaps bring Mr McNally in then. I, I've also, I to say, in, to declare an interest, I have had a letter back from the City of Glasgow about this, um, but uh, I won't uh, uh, steal your thunder in this, Mr McNally. I mean, can we answer the issue around costs? Uh, if you were offered the pilot next year, would you be in a position to run it? Uh, well, I'm not in a position to, to, to give that statement because anything like that would have to go through our committee process. Um, you know, my role as a, a team leader within the air quality team is to carry out the appraisal uh, process for low emission zones. Um, now, that's an appraisal process that should be coming out through the NLF and the Cleaner Air for Scotland strategy. Um, it's not out yet, so we've not been able to work through the appraisal process as of yet. In terms of the resources, we don't know yet what the resources would be to have an all singing and dancing low emission zone using... Uh, automatic number plate uh, technology. Like you said, that's also my understanding that the London scheme cost uh, £100 million to set up and, and, and run for a number of years. However, that is the Rolls Royce of low emission zones. It's a, it's a huge uh, low emission zone, the biggest one in the, uh, in the world that I'm aware of. Um, that's not quite the scale we would need here. But what was interesting was that the uh, DFT um, cost uh, costed um, the clean air zones for the five cities in England that were identified through the, 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 the National Air Quality Plan. And they came with a figure for five cities, probably equivalent to Glasgow's size of a total, total cost of about £101 million. So, back of a cigarette packet, that's maybe not the best... Uh, <laughs> analogy to use, but they, 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 you could, we could be looking at maybe maybe £20 million for a scheme the size of Glasgow, if you were to kind of just divide that sum by five. And that's only the cost to set up the technology and run the back room, so on, for, say, five, ten years. The cost for the operators of vehicles that are non-compliant, to make them compliant, um, whether it's either retrofitting, it's approximately fourteen to £15,000 per bus to upgrade it. Um, a new bus obviously costs over £100,000. Um, there are real challenges with the timescale of getting that work done to get the vehicles compliant within that time. A bus takes about two years from setting an order before you'll actually have a new one. A retrofitting an individual bus can take three to four days to, to fit the, the... So it's a logistical challenge to but do that. A technical point. I appreciate the whole detail has not been released yet. Um, but, in, but in London, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there's a complete coverage, 360 degree coverage of vehicles entering and exiting London. Um, is there any such existing system in Glasgow at all that could be upgraded? Do you have a camera recognition system that covers any of Glasgow that could be currently used or would it have to be a complete start from scratch if it's going to be that Rolls-Royce solution? I appreciate there's other ways of running a zone. And before you answer that, can I be clear, uh, are you saying that, that this, in spite of the fact that you have the most polluted street in Scotland, Glasgow, and looking at the range of options to tackle that, haven't looked in detail at a low emission zone uh, and linked into that, that would be the cost of setup and running it. What would be the cost, the income that would be generated by it, by vehicles paying 
Um, well, there's a couple of things there. First of all, we, <coughs> we looked at low emission zones as far back as uh, 2010, when we had a fee, uh, detailed, uh, sorry, when we had a feasibility study mm -hmm. done to examine the case for low emission zones, uh, and that was looking at buses okay. as a, a kind of target area. However, we weren't able to progress that because of all that was about 2010. That was when we started to become aware of the fact that the engine technology did not do what it was supposed to do. So we couldn't then progress a scheme when you could only get a Euro 4, Euro 5 buses and we knew they didn't work. So it's only since the Euro 6 buses have come out that we know that this will tackle nitrogen dioxide. Because the London Low Emission Zone and, and, and the other ones don't have a Euro 6 standard set for them. They've got a Euro 3 and Euro 4 in places. That will do next to nothing to improve uh, or to reduce levels of NO2 within Glasgow. It's going to have to be Euro 6. Okay. Um, so, yes, we, we're continuing to, to, to look at that within the city. I'm forgetting what was the second part of the is question. This, is, it, is it about income that might be generated? Oh, the, in, the income from it, well, it's, it's unlikely to, to be an income generating scheme because um, the idea of it is to to encourage mm -hmm. people to improve their vehicle. It's not like a congestion charge where you're expecting people to pay a daily charge. The idea is that you have a, a, a fine set for non-compliant vehicles entering that's, uh, that's set high enough that people don't want to come in if their vehicle doesn't comply. So it won't be about revenue raising. It will be about Not even in the initial stages where people fall foul of it. That, that's, that's not been... Th that kind of level of detail of the costing has not been completed. OK. Sorry, David. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I think the Commission just touched on the point I was going to raise, but in, in London, as you know, there is uh, the £10 toxicity or T charge, so there is an income generation to that. Um, as you probably picked up, I'm very enthusiastic about low emission zones. My issue is just about the bureaucracy of this. Are we going to see a pilot next year? What is it that both you local authorities will require from government to make an educated decision about going ahead with the pilot? Well, I, I would say the pilot or of any low emission zone is going to be dependent on the resources and funding that are available to us. And as of yet, we, we don't have that information. Mr Garrett? Hmm. Um, I can only repeat those comments. We're in exactly the same situation where we need to understand what the resource implications are. I, I guess the, the other thing I would add is that um, we have discussed this uh, with some of our um, local politicians, and there has been concern about the possibility of displacement um, around a low emission zone and what, that, what impact that might have on what are likely to be relatively quiet suburban streets. Mm. Right. Just to add to that, and the, the query about the bureaucracy of the, of the system, how long it's going to take to do. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand that the enabling legislation for this would be the uh, congestion charging powers under the 2001 Transport Scotland Act. Now, when the City of Edinburgh in 2003 to 5 developed detailed plans for congestion charging in the City of Edinburgh, there was a lengthy process of, well, w the city officials involved working very closely with Scottish Government officials to develop the relevant guidance. And, uh, yeah, that, looked, that took a lot longer than the period than between now and 2018. So, I think... It's very useful to know that there is primary legislation there. Uh, I suppose my final point, convener, is when I put this to the Cabinet Secretary um, in 21st of February 2007 about can we have it sooner and how many can we have, she said, and I'm quoting, low emission zones are something that local authorities decide on, so we would need local authorities to look at them, and quote. Now, I thought that was the other way around. If I was a local authority leader, I would want to know what the package is what the resources are available so I could implement that through the various committees. Um, what, what's the views of our two local authority representatives about this? Is it something you just bid for? But if there's nothing to bid for, how do you implement a pilot? Mr Garrett? Exactly. Um, I mean, we have been in discussions with uh, the Scottish Government about this, um, as have the four main cities, and we still don't know what the, what the offer is. It's not that we don't want to... Uh, take the best steps that we can take in order to address the issues. But it, it is going to be resource intensive and it's going to be very costly. Um, and so we need to understand what that means for a local authority before we can commit ourselves. Mr McNally? Yeah, I, mean, that's, that's, I was just echo that. And the only other thing is, will there be grant funding or assistance available for fleet operators to improve 
their fleets at the same time, because it's not just the cost to the local authority, it's going to be the cost to the bus operators who will almost inevitably pass that on to their customers if there's not assistance for them. And that may then lead to people not using buses, going back into their car, because people always operate in their own best interest. If it's going to be cheaper for them to take their car in, instead of using the bus if the fares go up, um, we're, we're going to have a real, a, real, a real problem there. We want them on buses, but we want them on, on uh, cleaner buses. Um, the only other things we may just add in would be in terms of the legislation. It's my understanding that um, if we are talking about a low emission zone being introduced, the legislation that would be used would be the, or the, 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 the way that would be done would be through traffic regulation orders. Uh, now, a TRO, if, it's, if there is an objection to it, can take a considerable time to get through um, for a local authority, um, especially if it's controversial or there are any challenges to it. It's not unusual for delays through the appeal process to drag it on for a year or two. I want to move this on to the um, rural setting, but before, Emma Harper has a brief supplementary. Yep, just a quick supplementary. Um, has there any been any thoughts about carpool lanes or incentivising employers to do a reward system for car sharing? Um, in a previous job I had that worked. Um, I'm just wondering, carpool lanes at a specific time of the day or specific days or even just for electric vehicles, is that an option? Um, well, we certainly, um, what we would say is that that would probably fit into the travel planning for larger employers. And um, that's something that we as a local authority, we've got our own travel plan and we condition uh, certain developments through the planning process to have travel plans in place for their staff and that can be included within that. In terms of actually making road space available for car pooling or car sharing, um, we don't have wide enough roads in, within the city to do that. Um, you would be creating more congestion which would slow the traffic down even more uh, and, and, and potentially increase pollution levels. I mean, one of the other things, there's the quality of the vehicles that are on the road, but one of the biggest problems we have in the city is just the topography of it. The high-rise buildings create the canyons that prevent the pollution being dispersed. We don't have, they're relatively narrow streets. We don't have that road space to introduce additional lanes for things like that. Now, there may be an option on some of the trunk roads. Um, I can't really answer for that because that's a Transport Scotland matter rather than a those roads are not controlled by the local authority, but it might be an option for them to consider. OK. Uh, Peter Chapman. Hi. Can I change the focus? We'll have a look at agriculture for a wee while. Now, we know that NO and nitrous oxide emissions are 31 per cent of agricultural emissions. But we also know that uh, nitrogen is an important input for agricultural production, but usage in the last number of years has been falling of, of, of nitrogen. So how can we continue to use nitrogen more efficiently in agriculture? And are NO emissions rising, falling or static at the moment? Professor Bob Reese, and I think I need to apologise to you. I don't think I mentioned you at the start. That's no problem. Um, so maybe I could answer that because I work on agricultural emissions. Um, so maybe it's just worth clarifying, first of all, what these emissions are. We, we've talked a lot about nitrogen today, and nitrogen is a pretty complicated element to get your head around. Um, so uh, agriculture is responsible for emit emitting small amounts of nitric oxide, um, it doesn't emit nitrogen dioxide, which is the gas that we've been talking about in urban settings, but nitric oxide can be oxidised to nitrogen dioxide in the atmosphere to can make a small contribution to that, but it's not really significant relative to the, the transport emissions. Um, but agriculture, as you mentioned, emits large amounts of nitrous oxide, which is a completely different gas, um, which is a greenhouse gas, and it doesn't have a direct impact on human health only indirectly through the climate change impacts that it causes. And uh, the other nitrogen gas that agriculture is responsible for emitting is ammonia, which we heard more uh, uh, a little bit about in the first session. So in answer to one of the questions in that session, ammonia emissions are actually increasing from agriculture. Um, we're um, going to be suffering consequences of uh, not reaching targets for emission reductions of ammonia and ammonia causes all sorts of problems. Um, it's an indirect greenhouse gas. Uh, it causes problems with biodiversity, causes acidification, and so on. So 
whole raft of issues there. Um, your question was about also um, how could we continue to use nitrogen in agriculture in a more environmentally friendly way. Um, I think that's quite a complex question itself. Um, nitrogen is critical to agriculture. Our production systems are dependent on inputs of nitrogen in all sorts of ways. Um, so we do need to continue to use it, but there are lots of things, small things, small steps that we can take to increase the efficiency of nitrogen use. Um, so there are technical fixes, there are um, more efficient farming processes, and farming continually improves its efficiency, so precision agriculture is something that's coming through at the moment, I think that's going to help. Um, there's probably no silver bullet, and, and some of the things that we would need to do are going to be somewhat costly. We've done a sort of cost analysis of various measures and there are things that can be done at low cost and others sort of start increasing in cost. So one of the issues is how we get finance into the industry to support that. And then finally, there's, it, it's not all about supply. There's also the demand issue and, and what products people actually want to eat from our food industry. So certain products, so meat, the meat products, for example, are associated with higher inputs and higher emissions than plant-based products. And there's, so there's an issue both of supply and demand in terms of trying to reduce emissions. But, but the, if I recall correctly, the evidence suggests that changing behaviours in an agricultural setting saves money. So mm -hmm. there is a benefit. Absolutely. And in the last parliament, there was a push to introduce mandatory carbon audits. Uh, that was from a climate change perspective, but I just wonder to what extent carbon audits might be beneficial to air quality. So the carbon audits in agriculture are designed at sort of promoting this increased efficiency that I've been talking about. They, they make um, farmers and landowners aware of the emissions that are associated with their enterprise. Um, they, they would be designed to improve... Uh, nutrient use efficiency and reduce emissions of the greenhouse gases primarily, so they wouldn't have a direct health benefit um, other than uh, sort of efficiencies that would be achieved by reduced ammonia emissions. Okay, that's useful to get that clarified. Sorry, Peter. Yeah. Yes, you did say that uh, ammonia emissions are rising at the moment, but you didn't, mm -hmm. you didn't answer my question. Are, are nitrous oxide emissions, are they rising, falling or static at the moment? Uh, nitrous oxide emissions are pretty static. I mean, the, the last year, which is 2014, that we have a report for, showed a very small increase, but it's, it's for the last three or four years, they've been pretty static. Mm. So as a proportion of total greenhouse gas emissions, agriculture is actually increasing in, in, the, sect, in the economy. I mean, uh, I... Can I you know, just I, come in on that very briefly? Yeah, Sorry, but why is ammonia rising, and what can we do about that? Sorry, uh, yeah, Peter, but... Um, yeah, it's, it's rising because we're not really doing anything to tackle it. Um, there's, there are no measures really being encouraged in the UK. Um, other countries are taking a more react, pro proactive approach to trying to reduce ammonia losses. Um, there are things that we could do, but they're not, they often cost money, and, and that's an issue. Uh, so that, that precludes a lot of the measures that we could take. I was just going to say that, uh, you know, I, I'm a farmer myself and I mm. recognise that the, the, the new technologies are making a huge difference. Mm. Targeted inputs and accurate soil mapping and, and, mm -hmm. and targeting in, inputs to that can, can certainly make a huge difference both to the, the environmental impact of agriculture and also to the bottom line because mm -hmm. it pays, as, 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 uh, as the convener says, it, it, it saves money and it, it, when you do it properly like that. So what other research has been carried out into these practices and how much progress has been made in understanding opportunities for mitigation and improving reporting of, of these emissions? Well, we, we've made a lot of progress in the last five or six years or so um, through improving the modelling of emissions from agriculture, and that's helped identify where we should target mitigation opportunities. I think there are still big uncertainties in emissions of um, uh, greenhouse gases and, and pollutants from agriculture because of the biological nature of the processes we're dealing with. These aren't engines and, and technical fixes that we can introduce. They're much more diffuse pollution sources. So the uncertainties are quite large. So um, 
you mentioned precision farming. I mean, this is being promoted a lot at the moment in the industry, and I think it provides some potential for improved efficiency. The research at the moment is still at a fairly early stage in terms of demonstrating reductions, for example, in greenhouse gas emissions, and that's one of the things we're working on at the moment. So we hope within the next few years we'll be able to quantify that, but at the moment it's, it's quite difficult to put a number on it. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, Mark Roscoe. Thanks. The issue of planning, uh, whether the planning system is adequately taking into account uh, air quality issues, and you know we heard the example earlier on about the planning of schools and the various pressures that councils um, find themselves under there. But um, I met with a group of constituents yesterday in Schoon, and they had a concern because they're faced with a number of uh, developments locally, housing developments, uh, which individually uh, wouldn't be assessed for their impact on air quality, but collectively uh, could make a significant difference, um, particularly to the uh, nearby air quality management area at Bridge End. <laughs> Um, could impact on, on health. Um, but this seems to be an issue that hasn't been dealt with within that local development plan process. Um, neither does it seem to be adequately addressed within a local transport strategy. So, and I'm hearing other kind of examples around, around Scotland of this as well, the planning system uh, perhaps not adequately dealing with air quality impacts. So I wonder if, if Craig McLaren could perhaps um, start with some thoughts on that and, and how perhaps planning reforms or tweaks the system might, yeah. might improve? Yeah, I, I think that the, the, the policy context for planning and air quality um, is there of sorts. If you look at the national planning framework and Scottish planning policy, they, they refer to air quality, but um, they, were, they were published um, before, or sorry, after, uh, sorry, not right, before the, um, um, the Cleaner for Scotland strategy was, was, was announced. So, so there's, a, there's a bit of work to be done on that. I think the other thing is that there's a timing issue here in that uh, many of the new style local development plans which have been put in place are still being developed and still haven't been adopted as yet. So issues like air quality probably weren't taken into consideration in earlier versions, uh, but they are starting to be taken into consideration now. So I think there's a, there's a bit of a timing issue which we need to, to address with that. Um, that said, um, I think one of the things that planners are trained to do um, is to look at the cumulative impact of, of uh, a range of different developments and to see what the impact of that is. So we need to think through how that could be made to work in practice. We, we've been doing some work with Environmental Protection Scotland and, and with SEPA. Um, we published in January a, a guidance note for um, local authority planners and for people working in air quality to try and um, make sure there's a, a better understanding of uh, the air quality issues and how planners could deal with it. So there's much more detailed guidance now that can be done now. Um, and I'm happy to provide a, a copy of that and a link to that to, to, to the committee if you want to, you want to see that as well. We've also been looking at the, the, um, uh, how we can introduce training for planners in particular. Um, and we've done some work on that. One of the issues we've had, and it goes back to a point I made earlier, is that um, there seems to be a, a feeling sometimes that, it, that the planners can solve everything and that they're the silver bullet, whereas it's not planning which is just the silver bullet. Planning sits within a broader local government and public sector landscape. And many other aspects of that public sector landscape have a more of an impact on things than planning. So what we've been trying to do is to make sure that um, air quality is addressed at a community planning level uh, as well, which brings together, as you know, many different public sector bodies and organisations, tries to align their uh, approaches to things and tries to see how they can uh, pull the resources together to make things work more effectively. So that there needs to be a broader look at this as well as just the planning side of things. OK. Uh, so, uh, Will Garrett wants to come in. Sorry, Will Garrett wants to come then, Tom Wright. Thank you. Um, planning is a subject, it's close to my heart. I'm a planner by uh, discipline, and um, I now have responsibility for developing the local transport strategy and air quality and placemaking. So within the reorganisation that's taken place within Edinburgh City Council, there's been a recognition that there's a need to bring these disciplines together in order to have uh, a serious impact on the outcomes. And it's the outcomes that we're all really concerned with. And uh, the outcomes are largely driven by the health agenda. So I think at a sort of strategic level, um, thinking in, about how we can improve outcomes for people in our, in our towns and cities and countryside, um, it's necessary to, to bring all these disciplines together, as has been said in Clean Air for Scotland, as has been said in the review of the planning 
uh, planning documentation and indeed the review of the transport strategy, the national transport strategy, all talk about this. Um, but I suppose the timing has been good for, for ourselves in Edinburgh because as part of the response to the, the uh, cuts we've had to make, we've reorganised ourselves in a way that can help deliver things in a coordinated and coherent way. So uh, that, that's the first point I wanted to make. In terms of the more detailed planning issues, uh, the local development plan does guide growth to locations which are accessible uh, in terms of active travel and public transport. That's a, you know, part of the process of identifying growth areas. Um, and the local development plan is supported by the uh, action program and the action program itself uh, but our, our own latest action program sets out something like 90 site-specific active travel actions that can take place in order to try and help shift people or give people an option when they get out of their front door as to whether they're going to go into the car, use a bike, walk, go to a park and ride site. And it's giving people options. That's, that's, that's I think, part of the answer to addressing the issues in, in terms of planning. Two points. Cleaner Air Scotland. Um, with regard to regional and local transport strategies, made a commitment to review the guidance on lo local and regional transport strategies. Um, the guidance on local transport strategies was, I think, produced in the year 2000. Um, I've not seen any review of uh, these guidance notes come out since Cleaner Air Scotland was, uh, was published, so that might be something that could be recommended. Uh, secondly, just to emphasise the incredible importance of land use planning in people's travel choices. Um, an example of a, a cycling city that's often brought up is the city of Groningen in the northern Netherlands, which has a very, very high mode share by cycle. Uh, what I'd like to emphasize is the importance of, of planning in bringing that about. Um, a long-term planning strategy has ensured that 78% uh, of residents live within three kilometers of the city center and 90% uh, of employees uh, uh, work within three kilometers of the city center. Those are journey distances that are very easily made by public transport on foot or by bike. But at the same time, I think it's important to bear in mind the nature of the Dutch planning system that can bring that about, which is basically more public sector led than the planning system that we have. this important placemaking agenda. Um, you know, we've seen Edinburgh, the uh, the rollouts, the gradual rollout across the whole city of uh, 20, area-wide 20 mile an hour speed limits, and I think to a lesser extent in Glasgow as well. Um, I'm just wondering to what, to what extent that's kind of factored into your work on placemaking and air quality and active travel. Is that something that's, um, that's seen as a, a significant intervention or? We all got it. Um, it is. It's part of a, a, a range of um, tools that we have at our disposal. Um, in terms of the transport budget, 10% of that now goes towards active travel. Um, so that's apart from the cost of implementing the 20 mile an hour zone. Um, but placemaking is critical to this. If we create the kind of places that people want to be in, they will necessarily be ones which are pedestrian dominated, ones which have better air quality, ones which encourage people to walk. Uh, it, it addresses so many issues. It seems to be kind of painfully obvious. In Copenhagen, a much quoted city, um, they have um, targets for the amount of time people spend outside. And so we're trying to increase that annually just because being outside is a good thing. And if you're working on that basis, then the world outside will improve in order to, to meet and help address those targets. So, uh, Craig so, McLaren and then Amelia Harkin. So I'll allow you to finish, we'll get it. So I, um, finish. I think that's, that's really what I want to say, is that it, it's a coherent approach to placemaking that is um, part of a broader answer to air quality issues. Craig McLaren. Yeah. Planning and placemaking, I use the terms interchangeably because I think they are trying to achieve the same objectives and the same outcomes. Um, 
there's a big role for planning and what this can be done and what can be done. Um, I think one of the issues is that um, the the impacts will not always be short term with planning. Uh, they'll be medium to longer term uh, much of the time. But it can do things. It can you can you can arrange towns, cities, settlements in a way where you minimise traffic. You can create attractive areas for people. Um, make them places where people do want to work. You can provide infrastructure for them to walk to uh, to do things as well. I actually chair the National Walking Strategy Delivery Forum, which is uh, an interesting moving a planner to do that. Um, and one of the reasons we've done that is to try and make sure that that whole active travel uh, issue is mainstreamed into to the planning, uh, the planning processes and thoughts as well. Things like designing building, greening places, yeah, it's, it's all there. And in many ways, it's been there for a long time, uh, and it's always contributed to the air quality agenda. It's just now there's been more of a, a stronger link uh, being articulated about how that's done. So the, the issue for me is, is, is not the fact that we can't do it, it's the fact that it's the ability to implement it and deliver it. And one of the issues we often have is that planners plan and most other people are the people who deliver the plans. And there's a need to try and make sure we bridge that gap. Um, be it the private sector, we should be getting the private, we should be thinking of the private sector, thinking about their contributions to, to air pollution, be they house builders or developers and people like that as well. Um, but we need to try and bridge that, that sort of implementation gap. Uh, I think that's incredibly important. And the other important thing, as I've said already, is that the fact that planning can often be seen as something that you just have to get through. It should be seen as something which is much more than that. It should be seen as if it's something that provides a route map for a better place. Simple as that. And that will help uh, tackle issues around air pollution, climate change and a host of other issues. Thank you. Emilia Hanna. Um, a lot of mention has been made to active travel uh, in the context of planning. Um, and I echo that. But I think it's also important to focus on transport budgets as well in terms of supporting active travel. Um, this year, uh, the Scottish Government will spend £150 per head on trunk roads and new motorways and £7 per head on walking and cycling infrastructure. Um, and I think that that speaks to the reason why we have such low rates of cycling across Scotland. Um, and I just want to bring up the, the example of Seville in Spain, um, where 80 kilometres of cycle lanes were uh, created between 2007 and 2010. Um, they saw a modal share increase from 0.5% to 7%, and air pollution levels were slashed in half uh, over a longer period, but between 2000 and 2012. So they were illegal, and now they're within the legal limits. And that, in large part, was because of the investment in safe cycling infrastructure, which enabled people to, to make that modal shift, and it brought about that behaviour change. So I think we need proper scrutiny of the Scottish Government's uh, transport budget and how much it's allocating on active travel. And I would applaud the efforts that have been made by Edinburgh Council to invest 10 percent of their transport budget in cycling. Claudia Beamish. Thank you. It's just to, um, in relation to planning, just to, to ask if those who haven't yet commented, or indeed those who have, in a more, in a broader sense, um, whether the gap between policy and the delivery of um, better air quality, um, how, how that can be affected by specific actions um, to bring about a culture change and a more holistic approach. And I appreciate that some people have commented on that already, but really honing down into, into what specifics could be done um, to have a more holistic approach and a culture change. Briefly, in terms of answers. Anyone? Amelia Hanna. Um, so in terms of policies, I think we need a strong network of low emission zones across all of Scotland, not just one city, um, which supports the transition for buses such that the bus sector can thrive through low emission zones rather than suffer. Um, we need to look at re-regulating the buses altogether so that uh, uh, passenger use of buses can increase, um, and I think the bus bill should be looked at, the one that's going through Westminster. Um, we need to invest more in cycling. We need uh, to bring about 20 mile per hour zones uh, as, the, as the default in, in urban settings, and we need to enable councils to introduce workplace parking levies. In relation to planning, um, Scottish planning policy at the moment it is uh, slightly weak on air quality. It says that uh, air quality should be considered. Um, that needs to be strengthened through the planning review as well. I would just um, 
Specifically about the planning, um, I would just uh, note that there has been a huge you know, improvement or recognition of the work that planning can do for air quality. I mean, my own city, Glasgow, has moved from, and I don't want to infuriate any planners here, but deciding it was a good idea to put a motorway through the city centre to now where we have an uh, uh, avenues project taking place where they will be um, creating avenues which uh, promote uh, sustainable travel, cycling and walking, and um, public transport at the expense of cars. Um, the, the other thing in, in relation to planning, I would just point out that there is an issue with wood burning and biomass, which seems to have been promoted as a greener alternative. And uh, you know, it may be um, that there has been a move towards uh, promoting biomass in areas where it's not suitable. We have seen the biggest improvement in air quality within uh, the UK attributable to the banning of uh, burning of coal and uh, solid fuels. We may be undoing some of that by promoting wood burning and biomass uh, in, in our areas where we can get onto the grid. Can you quantify grid. the scale of the problem? Because we try to get a handle on this earlier. All we know is that it's growing. Um, it's difficult to quantify exactly what it is. But I mean, it's within certainly within London, they seem to be noticing that out with uh, times where you have peak traffic movement, they can on cold nights notice that they are getting increases in particulates. Now, it's not the same problem here that it is in London at the moment, but there is the potential for that to, 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 to get worse. Uh, and we don't really have, uh, I think, good enough controls on that at the moment. Um, the other thing is just, just briefly to mention, we need further investment in cycling and walking. That is the long-term answer to pollution within our, within our uh, urban areas. Um, there's also a lot of... Uh, work that we are able to do within the local authority purely because we get ring fence grants from the Scottish Government to enable us to do air quality works. So um, I would just kind of try and raise the point that that money is appreciated and I would like to see that continue over the, the longer term. Okay. Uh, Craig McLaren. Yeah, convener, um, three things just to mention. There's a review going on the planning system just now, as you'll, as you'll probably know. Um, we've been talking about some key principles for the planning system and that which I think would help with this agenda. One is that it should be much more front-loaded in how it's, how it's done. We should be having the discussions with communities, with stakeholders, and making decisions as to what we want to do and who's responsible for what very much earlier in the system than we, in the process than we do just now. And that would give us a clearer idea of where we want to go and, and a route map. The second thing is, is this corporate uh, agenda and where planning fits in corporately in, in the public sector. Uh, and I've said earlier that it's, there's, a, there's probably an issue that seems to be... It, has to, it had been sidelined and seen as something which is regulatory, and that's important. But there's a lot more about recognising the benefits of great places and place making and planning and, and doing that and being a preventative uh, discipline which can actually make things uh, better. And, and the, the final thing of that has been about uh, much more collaborative in how we do things. And there are lots of different things which affect places which planning has no control over, just now or no link into. And we need to make sure things like the review of the National Transport Strategy thinks about this. Uh, we need to think about things such as city region deals, which are the main ways in which infrastructure has been funded just now. How this is going to fit into this, what the, mm. what the connection is to that as well. Uh, and that, there are lots of other disciplines, strategies and uh, objectives which have an influence on this, which we need to look at as well. Okay. And finally, Tom Rye. Yeah, just to um, refer back to Claudia's question, how do we encourage an integrated approach to this? We've heard a lot about the maybe imbalance of funding or funding being put into things that aren't really encouraging the improvement in air quality in many ways. Uh, so there should be a shift of funding, of funding to walking, cycling, public transport, and a more integrated approach to air quality management. But if you build into that some conditionality that people have to work in a cross-sectoral way, then I think that could also stimulate the, um, the integrated approach that you seek. OK, thank you. Can I uh, thank very much the witnesses for their contribution uh, to this session and the, the earlier one? Um, uh, the committee's next meeting will take place on the 16th of May. Uh, as agreed earlier, we will now move into private session, and I ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is closed. Thank you.